Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Welcome to episode 268 of The Team House. I'm Jack, here with Dave, and our guest on tonight's show is Melvin Downs, uh, who served in the British military, starting as a boy soldier at age 16, went all the way up and retired as a sergeant major in the Special Air Service. Uh, we're really excited to have him on the show tonight. Uh, you guys can find him on Instagram at Melvin Downs, that's M-E-L-V-Y-N-D-O-W-N-E-S. Uh, go check him out, and you'll find links in the description to uh, his Instagram and also his YouTube channel that's going to um, be popping probably next week. Um, so, Dave, you want to uh, uh, do a yeah. quick... Yeah, <clears throat> we just... Uh, well, first off, welcome, Melvin. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks, Jack. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Team House. And it's great to be able to chat to you guys, especially across the pond. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Before we get started, uh, we just want to give a shout out, quick shout out to our sponsor, uh, Legacy, at uh, GiveLegacy.com. Um, Legacy provides sperm testing and freezing from home, eliminating the need for, uh, for visits to a doctor or traditional fertility clinic. Um, so how it works, Legacy will send a sample collection kit to a client's home. Men produce a semen sample at home and send the kit back within 24 hours. So nothing out of the usual for most of us out there. Uh, the kit contains uh, transport media that keeps the sperm sample fresh until it arrives in the lab. And then they take care of everything from there. Legacy in the military. Look, guys, veterans and members of the armed forces have twice the risk of infertility than the general population. Sperm health can be affected by lifestyle, age, injury, and environment, including exposure to toxic chemicals, such as those in burn pits, radiation, and pollutants. Hundreds of men in high-risk occupations, like police, firefighters, and members of the military, use Legacy to test and freeze their sperm. Um, so Legacy is involved uh, with a number of military programs, including Military Family Building Coalition, which is Naval Special Warfare, uh, the Operation Baby Foundation is a veteran-funded nonprofit organization, um, and Veterans Advantage uh, advocates for respect, recognition, and uh, rewards for service members. Uh, they are also in uh, participation with the Green Beret Feder Foundation. Uh, Green Berets get access to Legacy's at-home sperm testing and one year of cryopreservation for free. So if you are interested in family planning, but now is not the time, or if you're in one of these fields, um, especially if you're in one of these fields, that has a tendency to have that effect, check out GiveLegacy.com. Check out their programs. Um, you might be, <clears throat> you know, uh, eligible for some, uh, for some discounts or, you know, some, some uh, cooperation with them. And even if you're not, check them out. Uh, family planning is important, and they're a great resource. So thank you. And back to you, Melvin. So, Melvin, uh, I want to jump right into it uh, and ask you about, you know, your origins and kind of your upbringing, uh, how you came to be, what your, what your upbringing as a kid was like, and how that sort of propelled you towards military service. Yeah, sure. Uh, to, well, to start with, my dad, he, he came from Jamaica in the early 50s, 1952, uh, from the uh, uh, ring from the Windrush era, and he was, came to rebuild the UK after the Second World War. Uh, and then he met my mom and uh, met her in Stoke-on-Trent. Now, if you don't know about the UK, Stoke-on-Trent, it's in the Midlands. It's in the heart of uh, the country. And at that time, especially uh, in Stoke-on-Trent, the area where my dad settled, because he, he went down the pits being a miner, mm. and the area he settled in was an area called uh, Bentley. Now, Bentley was a large council housing estate, which I think is a bit like the projects over yeah, your yeah. way. But it was a brand new one. It was a massive estate. Actually, when it was first uh, got built in the 50s, it was the largest in, in uh, Europe. It was massive. But the difference was in this estate, it was just mainly white working class because this is back, back in the 50s. And he met my mom and their parents at that time didn't like the idea of a black guy going out, a Jamaican black guy going out with a white girl. And they were both young, very, very young. So she left home and they just went and made their way anyway. My dad worked hard. He settled in this uh, estate. And that's where I was brought up, in, in Bentley Council Housing Estate. But the diff what 
what was a well not a problem but what I, I was looked at as different because there was literally an handful of uh, black people in, in on that estate and there was something like 11 12,000 people on that estate and it was mainly white working class miners and you know old working people and so the area we settled there was a lot especially you know I was born in 64 so by the time I got there it was 67 I can remember it it was uh, there was a lot of racial tension back in them days so I had a, a lot of bullying a lot of uh, hard knocks growing up and so did my dad. We got the house burgled. We had petitions. People didn't want us there. I think it was just it was just a totally different time and a different era, you know. Uh, however, I I'm I just I'm thankful that the positive was it made me the person who I am because I literally going to school in my year there was like one other uh, well in the entire school there's one other black guy and an Asian girl. So that's that's what it was a case of. So from a very young age I was bullied and I had to fight back and my dad told me fight back but apart from that you know it was just that time and I made the best friends there and the way I look at it if it was the other way around if it was just a couple of white guys or a, a mixed race family uh, living in a large black area it'd be exactly the same you get picked up picked on until you know people knew who you were and and then my dad especially he's a really uh, respectful person, but he'd also stand up for himself. So even he, you know, he'd, he'd fight his own, he'd fight his battles, and he'd, he'd be proud and all, all that. So, growing up was quite difficult, but like I said, it made me the person I am, and, and I made really good friends there. I'm not knocking the place; I still love the area. It was just a total different era, and, and the way I look at it, if you go back at 30 years from then or whatever, you know, women didn't even have the vote. I don't think, you know, <laughs> right. and let alone. Uh, gay people being uh, welcomed in anywhere and so on. So it was just a different time and a different place. But as I said, so growing up, uh, it was quite difficult. But you had to learn to be fight, uh, fight and look after yourself. And basically that was it. Or you just get bullied and trodden on. Anyway, I always wanted to go in the, in the military because the Jamaicans, they loved the Queen. And it was the motherland. That's what they called, you know, the Caribbeans. And it used to make me stand up whenever... Uh, the, the national anthem was on 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 TV, and then I'd be watching all the trooping of the colours. And it, from a very young age, I just loved anything to do with the military. So that was it. I was hooked on it. So 11 years old, I joined what was known as the Army Cadets. Say so it's a bit like the Scouts, but uh, you, you fire weapons as well. But it's, it's all military minded. So you learn navigation skills, you learn survival, you go camping you learn medical skills and to me that's what i really enjoyed because i'm not at all academic in the school we went the back in the day it was you just did what you want really so that made sense to me it was doing something what i thought okay that this is what's needed in life whereas trying <laughs> why do you not need to know about geology or geography you know what sort of stones this and that so that was me i was hooked on going in the military so i joined the army cadets at 16 i mean sorry at 11 and then at 16, when it's once left school, two weeks later, I was in the British Army. Uh, as, as, as a 16-year-old, you do what's known as it's a junior leader's battalion or junior infantry. So it, you're a soldier, uh, but you can't go on operational tours. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing, if you joined when you were, say, 18, you would spend something like 18 weeks basic training. Whereas as a 16-year-old, you do one year's basic training. And as you know, basic training's tough. So we had a longer time of it. Wow. But I loved every minute of it. And uh, actually got, they give you a rank system there. So I made it to Sergeant Major in, in the Junior Army. And that was because I was in the cadet. So I already, had a, I already knew some basic drill and basic tactics and some weapons and navigation and first aid. So I really shone there. Anyway, from 16 then, I went to my parent unit, which was an, an infantry unit. And back in the day, you go to the normal infantry unit, which was around your area. So I joined the Staffordshire Regiment, and it's all guys from the Midlands, where I am, from Stoke-on-Trent and Birmingham area. So you sort of know people. It's like the old Pals Regiment. They start in... It's not as much now. They've sort of changed a bit like the American system, where you can be from all over the place. But here, it was mainly guys from all... 
certain uh, certain area of the UK. About say seventy percent would be from that area. So I loved that, and I loved everything about the military. My first posting was Gibraltar. So I had a year out there, and to me, oh, it's fantastic. This was a seventeen-year-old, and when we, we moved back to UK, he's an eighteen-year-old, and then uh, I, we started training up to go to Northern Ireland. So I went on the first operational tour of Northern Ireland as a I was 19 by the time we got there. Wow. And back in this time, this is like 1984, I was in the actual close observation platoon. And what this meant is just lying in bushes for up to 10 days and nights, observing where terrorists, likely terrorist uh, houses were and reporting on them and so on. So it was like a specialist platoon within the infantry. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed that. However, that was like the first taste of... Uh, operations and then I ended up losing a good friend there and a couple of others so then you you realise wow this is for real but it was really unusual because Northern Ireland is part of Great Britain and you could be walking in one street and everybody loves you and then you cross the road into another street and everybody hates you then you cross the other road and so on and and there you are as a a young soldier you just try and be neutral keep the peace and it was just really confusing anyway uh, that was my first operational tour. And then that's when I really got wind of the SAS. Because what used to happen, we'd be lying in these observation posts watching uh, a, a terrorist house and just seeing for activities. And then if we we potentially saw, think we've seen something like maybe weapons moving in and out and so on, we would pass up to our HQ and then suddenly you'd have these other guys come in, move us out, and these guys turn up like with beards and everything. And I'm like, who, who are these? And they go in there and then they take over the job if they think it's going to go down. And then I found out this, these were the SES. I thought, right, this is what I want to be doing. I want to be go, uh, joining this. So that was my first time actually had any indication of joining the Special Forces. But I'll tell you what happened uh, later on as I go through my career about why I got put off that. Anyway, I came back from that first tour uh, of Northern Ireland, and then we went to Germany, and that's like when I, the first time I, I sort of started working with Americans or met Americans because we'd go down to American bases, and you had all the lovely PXs and stuff like that. So we, we was like over there for the Cold War, and then I went back to Northern Ireland for a second tour, but this time I was a corporal so i was in charge of eight people mm-hmm. so the first time was a private and the second time was a corporal anyway in between this we had a lot of guys go for the SAS selection for my unit but it'd only ever been one guy getting before and one officer and i didn't know him and you know we have lots and lots of guys trying but very very few get in as i said i was i was actual third ever person but many go go for it and then they come back with excuses instead yeah. of just saying i wasn't good enough right i right. vw'd they come back with, oh, the instructor didn't like me, always this, that, and the other. And I remember this guy, and he was a really good good guy, and he got to the jungle phase, and then he came back. And I said to him, right, I want to go for that. And he said, no, you can't go for that, Mal. I goes, why is that? He goes, oh, because you're black. I goes, what's that got to do with it? And he said, well, we work all, no- it's mainly in Northern Ireland undercover. They have to hang around the bars and blend in. Back in that day, there's no way, you know, I, I haven't got ginger and frettles. I, yeah. I couldn't come I across say, an Irish be, Being black yeah. in Ireland, you've got to be hard as nails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I thought, okay, that's a fair point. So I, I, ne- I never even thought about going for the SAS again until we had this officer came to our unit, and he did two years in the SAS. And I remember seeing him, and he come to my uh, company, and he was just so different than the normal officers. Normally, you know... You get some good officers, but in the British Army, you have some officers. They just turn up and they walk in the dog and they're watching all the troops doing their work. And they, they can, they're more concerned with doing how good you are at drill and inspections. And they've right. got a big check on the, uh, the uh, camp and they want to make sure everything's immaculate and so on. This guy, he didn't, he didn't want any of that. He wasn't bothered with the bullshit and if you were good at drill or how good the rooms were and how clean the rooms were. All he was concerned is if you was if you could shoot, move and communicate, you was a good soldier on the ground. And he was different. He was there with you all the time. And he really inspired me. Anyway, he goes to me. This was after I'd done my second tour of duty in, in Ireland. He goes to me, why don't you go for the SAS? I go, and I told him the exact same story. I goes, I can't uh, and he goes, why is that? I goes, because of being black. And he just stopped. And, and I told him that 
you know, I have to go undercover in Ireland. And he just burst out laughing. And he goes, obviously, you couldn't go sitting in a pub. You'd stick out there. But you could be on the reactive side, the covert side. And there's lots more goes on in the world that, that right, then you right. think about it, you should go for it. So that was me then convinced. I'm like, right, I'm going to go for this. Uh, so this is now about 19, yeah, 19, end of 1989. And I've just done a second tour of duty in Northern Ireland. So that's two operational tours. Yep. Anyway, I put in all my paperwork to go on the SES selection. And by this time, it was 1990. And then we was an armoured infantry regiment now because we were based in Germany. And we got the new armoured fighting vehicle, which was the Warrior at the time, a bit like your Bradley. So I was a corporal in charge of, including myself, 10 people in this, in this vehicle. And then we got told about the Gulf War and all that was starting to get stir up and we was going to be going over there so i withdrew my paperwork because i thought there's no way i'm going to go on ss election while my unit's going to go to war right so i I withdrew my paperwork and then we went over on the first gulf on the first gulf war in the 1990 and until 1991 and we was deployed over there we actually went in something like the august and we were just hanging around the desert doing all the manoeuvres and everything. And it was fantastic because they give you that much ammunition because you were the build-up for the war. And, and again, we was working with the U.S. Uh, Marines at stages. You know, sometimes you'll have changeovers. They come in our vehicles. We were going there, Bradleys, all tactics together. And, and it was great. I, I really enjoyed all that. And then, But we never thought that war would happen. However, then when it did, even though it was only on you know, four days and nights, it was, it was short and sharp, and that was like the first introduction to proper combat. And on that, I, you know, I was in my first real engagement, and we lost a couple of guys, saw it happen, and you, we took objectives. So that was like a, a proper combat scenario. Anyway, we came back from could, there could, in could 91. You, before, before moving on, I mean, could you tell us about yep. that firefight and, and what transpired there? Oh, yeah. Well, well first of all, what, what it was... We were told, right, okay, we was armoured infantry, so it was an infantry battalion in their armoured fighting vehicles working close with the uh, Challenger tanks in support, so you'd work together. And then we get orders to go, we, we're going to be attacking this position. So we, we dug in on the border, first of all, watching all the bombardment go off for about a month. And then it came, right, this is it now, we, it's happening, we're going in. I remember all the MRLSs going in, all the rockets, and it was like, it was shaking our vehicle. So I'm in, in the back with all the lads, and I'm like, just think how bad it is on that side. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we're on this side. Anyway, we thought we was going to go to, the, to do this attack, and when we got there, there was nothing left. There was just bodies and people wanting surrender and so on. Mm-hmm. And then that happened again, and we heard out, we heard over the radio that a couple of our guys had been injured in, in another company, and they had a full-on attack. So in a way, we was like, "Let's come on, we want to have our share," you know what I mean? And we just thought nothing's going to happen because every time we got to somewhere, it was over the first say 48, 48 hours, there was just nothing left, and people just wanting surrender. And then we were told, right, okay, we're going to this other uh, area. And instead of being a battalion size, it's only an, an, a uh, company size location. We're just going to attack that. But when we got there, literally, a tank being touched, and there was hundreds and hundreds of, of guys coming out of the trenches, and most of them wanted to rend there. Mm-hmm. However, we started getting incoming in the Warriors. So then we were told to move forward and take the objective. And it was really confusing because then, as you were taking the objective, there was also people trying to surrender, and then right. there's pockets of enemy firing. Mm hmm. But Crazy. what happened was, and this is what I'd say, this is one of the proudest days still in my military career, because we was told as a, uh, commanders were told, you have to be in the back of the vehicle when you open them doors so you can push the blokes out, make sure everybody gets out when the, when the incoming starts. But I said to my blokes, I'll be at the door, at the front door, and I'll be the first out, make sure you guys follow me, because if you don't and I come back... <laughs> I won't be an happy bear. And, uh, yeah, you know what I mean? And, yeah. I want to be in. Anyway, and one time he was getting the incoming. We could hear the incoming on the on the vehicle, and we knew he was getting a lot of incoming. Got through a, an area, and we did buzz. And that, I looked left and right, and you've got all your guys there, and then just started doing the drills. Because as you know, when you practice drills that much, you forget about all the other shit what's going on. You're just into that drill mode, mm-hmm. which is it's, it's brilliant. Anyway, that was happening, and then 
took a position and people were surrendering. And then about 50 meters to the right, there was a bunch of Iraqis waving white flags and wanting to surrender. So my mate's vehicle went to the side and it was bizarre watching it happen. Like, and they were debuzzing. They come around the side of their vehicle. And as they come around the side of their vehicle, these guys, somebody fired an RPG from this group. And they took the sand and bounced up. And then the entire war edit, one of the guys, Carl Moult, one, one, you know, went through him, hit the vehicle, but then went up in the air and sort of exploded in the air. And the, the two lads next to him, right by him, nothing happened to him. They just thought... It was uh, the smoke discharges going off and all white phosphorus. Mm. And so, and that happened, you know, literally 50 meters away right in front of us. So that was obviously telling it and, and so on. So that was like the first full on combat. Because yeah. before in Northern Ireland, we've had things happening with terrorists, but not a, a proper full on firefight. Military on military battle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was, it was bizarre. And then we, ca- we carried on moving forward. Then the next day, we were we halted right on the Basra Road, and we were told, wait there. And we didn't realize then that this was the end. We got told that was it. And it was just as the Basra Road, literally, it must have been hours before, all the vehicles were moving up from Kuwait, and uh, the Iraqis were just trying to run up this Basra Road and get back into Iraq in Baghdad and wherever, Basra and Baghdad. So they were leaving Kuwait, coming up, and it's a six-lane highway. So... They had all their tanks on the on the sides going up, and their vehicles, and they, they stole all civilian vehicles, and including coaches and whatever. And they were all just it was literally bumper to bumper vehicles, and you can imagine the coalition forces just went up and down the road and just blitzed everything. So it was it was a really bizarre sight. We stopped there, and there were still burning vehicles. There was bodies everywhere. Most of the vehicles were completely burnt out, but a lot of them they just been shot up. And they hadn't been touched. And we was told, right, you've, you've, we're waiting here now. And the rumours come that it's going to be the end of the war. And that was it. And we just sat there. <laughs> and we said, don't, don't move, because we'd been dropping, dropping our own mines around the area that the <laughs> Air Force had. So there's all mines everywhere. But you know what it's like? They tell you stop. And I'm a corporal in charge of my tank. I'm like this. You're bored. And you start just looking around and, and checking everything out. And... Uh, yeah, it was just a really weird scene. It was like a scene from Hal, all these burnt, burnt out vehicles and you go on a coach and there'd, there'd be this one coach, all these dead Iraqis, that's in, but the, the vehicle hadn't set on fire. So they, it was just like something from an horror movie, you know, yeah. it was really weird because you hadn't seen anything like that before. And yeah. it took about three days before the engineers come up, came up and then moved all, started moving all the vehicles and that off. So that was it. So it was like a short and sharp uh, right. war, really. Anyway, I came back from that. Now this is 91. And then I thought, right, I'm going to go straight on SES selection. However, they put me straight on my sergeant's course. And uh, I went on this. I thought, right, OK, this will be good. Because you have to do this course even within the SES. Mm-hmm. Once you in the SES, if you get, uh, once you get to the rank of sergeant so I thought if I get the course in now that's a bonus and it'll give me more experience so I went to this course as soon as I passed it they made me up to my sergeant now I've got a full platoon and we also got an emergency tour of Northern Ireland so this is my third tour of Northern Ireland first time was a private second time a corporal in charge of uh, eight guys and now I've got 30 guys and a young lieutenant because basically the sergeants would run it Anyway, so I thought, right, I can't go on SS selection now. Why my guys are going to Northern Ireland again? So I did another tour of Northern Ireland, and by the time I finished that, uh, it was uh, we get we moved back to, uh, to Germany, and that's when I finally got to go on SS SS selection. So I thought to myself, well, I've had three operational tours of duty of Northern Ireland. I've been in a, a proper full-on war. I'm already a sergeant with 12 years of experience in the infantry and armoured infantry. I thought, right, I'm, you know, I'm good to go. I've got, you know, I'll be good for the special forces. I'll, I'll be hitting the ground running. Boy, little do, do you know. And then <laughs> once you get in there, within about 18 months, you've done a lot more and it's just like craziness, isn't it? Yeah, yeah you do so much. So anyway, I went on selection. So now this is January 1994. I went on a winter selection course and uh, actually passed the first time. And I got into the uh, D Squad and SAS. So that was the start of my 
military career. That's, from, a, that's, you know, a, yeah, to then. that's an amazing start, to, the way you phrase it, to start. I mean, you did four, four deployments with the conventional military, uh, including combat. Um, what, what was it like, you know, you're a platoon sergeant going to SAS selection. I mean, what was that experience like? I mean, it, it, it feels like maybe you were better prepared for it than say, you know, a younger junior guy who, who didn't have as much experience. Yeah, sure, Jack. And, and in, in hindsight, I'm glad now looking back that when I first wanted to go for it, I most probably want to, you know, pass, you never know, but I don't think I was mature enough at the time. Yeah. So I had a lot more experience. Uh, however, you find most most blokes who go on it were of senior uh, lance corporals and corporals. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you get a few sergeants on it, and even to go on it, you've got to have done uh, back then. You start to have done at least three years and, and being a certain standard. Yeah. Uh, so generally, uh, you get guys who are, who are really up for it, and and especially in our day, they have to take everyone who wants to go on the selection, and they go away for a beat up first. They have a, a weekend in Erifed and they do all basic techs just, just to make sure they are fit enough to at least start the course. Because what was happening in the past, lots of guys were putting in to go on this course. And then even if they failed and come back after a week, they would, they were looked upon as an hero because nobody knew anything about this. Right. right. So like, that's what I said. I never did. And it was like, wow. And they were coming back all these stories. But you still give them so much respect because they went there, you know. Right. It was just, it was just that type of yeah. scenario. So, Yeah. Uh, I, in hindsight, yeah, it did, it did definitely help me because of having the experience. But as you know, it's it's a total different way of life. I'm, I, I say like the normal army is is like we call the green army. It's great. I really enjoyed it. You, uh, you know, you always go back to your roots. I loved that time of being a sergeant and having troops in command. But once as soon as you get into the special forces, it's totally different. Instead of being formal. It's, it's informal. Everybody knows you by your name. There's no saluting. There's no yes sir, no sir. And there's no bullshit like marching around, uh, no ironing the kit. It's just because you haven't got time. Everything's operations, operations, operations. And if you're not on operations, preparing for an operations. And if you're not preparing for an operations, you're, you're on an intense training, you know, training, uh, getting other courses going. And then last but not least, there's a bit of leave if you can ever fit it in. And, and as you know, you just... that. That's that's a luxury. So it was just full on. I and I really, I really enjoyed the the, the selection process. Don't mm. get me wrong, it was the hardest uh, physical and mental uh, thing I've done in my life. And that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to push you to your physical limits, and also psychological your your mental limits. But what nearly broke me is when I first got there. Mine was the first combined one where the Marines. The SBS and SES did the entire course together. Because prior to this, the SBS used to do their own ills phase, the aptitude phase part, and then you'd all meet up in the jungle. And mm. this was the first time everybody was together. So there was all these big m Marines, because they're generally Marines uh, in, in our military do more fitness. It's, a, it's an harder course to get in than the normal army, than the normal infantry. And then you've got the paras, and they do more fitness. They have to do, a, a, it's generally more difficult to get in the paras than a normal infantry course, even though infantry is great. These guys do a bit more training. So a lot of the people who go for the special forces are, are from either a parachute background or a, a marine background. And I remember going there and looking at these guys, and some of them you think, man, mountains, you know, if, Oh, I nearly, I nearly sighted myself out of it thinking because I was the only guy from my unit and there's 200 people there. And I'm looking at these guys thinking they could walk forever with a mountain on the back. And then you've got these very, very intelligent officers. I, I, was, I listened to all these officers speaking and I'm just lying on my bunk bed. You know, you're all just in big rooms. I'm listening to these guys and they were uh, officers and they were saying, oh, about their university and they were coming out with these big words. I didn't even know what they meant, you know what I mean? And I'm like, <laughs> God, one, I'm not going to be fit enough and two, I'm not intelligent, intelligent enough for this. So I nearly signed myself out. But then, as you start the course, suddenly you see these big, thick guys uh, just falling out yeah, of it because yeah, yeah. mentally it doesn't matter. Mm. It's up there, as you know, you keep going and the pain barrier is the same for everyone. So you're pushing yourself and pushing yourself, and that sort of motivated me. And then, uh, and, and also I had an incident, what happened there, again, going onto a, not so much a bullying incident, but it was a 
a bit of a racial inc incident what happened there. I'm lying on my bunk bed, and all these guys, they're talking about the routes that they're going to go on. And they had a, a bunch of six lads, all from the Paras, and they were talking about the thing, this is going to be the next route. I had no idea. Nobody really does. But there's only so many routes you can go around the Brecon Beacons. There's only so many hills there. You gotcha. know you can go up these mountains one day, but you don't know which mountain. And these guys thought they knew the area, and they were all just talking together. So I'm lying on my bunk bed, and I was just like a normal infantry guy. I jumped up to him. I goes, hi, guys. Uh, do you mind if I have a look at the map? Do you, do you mind if you let me know this? And one of them just turned around, and, they, you know, because you went paratrained, they started calling names, and one of them come out with, like, a, a racial word, a really bad slur. And, I was, you know, I was so angry because I was always told, stick up for yourself, and, and I didn't because I thought in the back of my mind that if I start arguing a fight with these guys, one, the one, there was five or six of them, they, they'd batter me, but it wasn't that. I've been battered all my, all my life, but I've stood up myself, stood up for myself. It doesn't matter if you get kicking, you've just got to, you've got to defend yourself against the bully. But I thought to my dad, and I'm like, shit, he would, he would go mad. However, I can't get kicked off this course. But that was one of the best things, because... That was the incentive then. I thought, right, there's no way I'm going to leave this course before any of them guys. And I didn't. And as, the, as it got worse and worse, I remember pushing on and then watching a couple of these guys leave. And before you know it, the 200, what started the course, went down to, you know, about just under 40. And that was what was left going to the jungle. And then we went on the jungle phase. And I'd never been in the jungle before. And I remember this same guy saying, oh, we'll see how all these hats, that's what they call it the normal infantry, he's saying, I'll see how these guys go in the J in the jungle, because he's been there before, and so on. And I'm, I'm like, okay. Anyway, when we get to the jungle, again, I wouldn't leave until, he, uh, you know, there's no way I'm going to leave this course until that guy, at least. And these guys, a couple of them left. Eventually, I, I saw him leave. He just VW'd voluntary withdrawal because at any time you want you can just say I've had enough and just go yeah. to the helicopter in the jungle and just wait and get the next helicopter out and I watched them go and that was about two weeks into the, the jungle and then I thought to myself wow who've I got go for now and this, this right. was my incentive right. I'm like shit I've just got to carry on now for, and, and get through this but I did I, and, and the main thing was even though you've never been in the jungle before you get taught everything and that's all the, the selection process is, and that really is all what the Special mm. Forces is for the start. At the beginning, they just want you to do the basics properly, and they teach you something. And so to me, it was like, right, I'm doing exactly. They tell me, stay there, don't move. <laughs> I stay there, don't move. They tell me this, that, and the other. I would just do it to the, to the, to the letter and just got through it. So, yeah, I got through the jung uh, jungle stage. And this is, most people say this is where it, they pick you because... Um, you watched, uh, there's a group of four of you, and you sort of watch 24-7. You know, they, they, they'll, the instructors will come with night vision goggles or whatever, and they like to see, they like to watch when, nobody, when they don't think you're, when you don't think anybody's around. They like to see what's going on in the background, see who's helping each other make a model, see who's, who's the uh, DS DS watcher, who only works when like the, the instructor's around yeah. and so on. So, they get to know the person really well, and and you, they, they got you. You can't you can't hide in that jungle, you know, and uh, uh, you can't get out of it. So that's where you pick, sort of thing. Anyway, but when you finish that, you go and that, arguably, I'd say this was the most difficult part is going on to the uh, uh, the survival part and the interrogation part where you go on the run. Because let's face it, even even the ills phase, if you were ex if you were a really fit civilian and uh, you're very good at navigation and you're very determined, you could get really through the aptitude phase of uh, uh, tapping over the mountains and hills. And, you know, getting through the jungles, yeah, very, very difficult. But maybe you could get through that. But how do you train your mind? How do you train yourself right. for going on the run for so many days and nights and then getting beastie for 36 hours? You just don't go through that. And to me, <laughs> that's when they push you to your... Obviously, they try to push you to your physical limits, but without injuring you. They don't want people injured, but unfortunately, on some, sometimes on courses, we've had people badly injured or the odd person die. It's part of it, but they even do, they put all the safety measures in. It, it happens because you push that much physically. And then mentally, it's the same. They won't push you to your breaking limits, but they've got to get an happy medium because they push you too far 
then you know that's it. You, it's hard to fix a mind. And yeah. again, on this, I remember seeing a some officer, and I thought to myself, he's really intelligent. He'll remember everything they've told him. And but I couldn't believe it. He left the course because he just started speaking and started writing things down and everything. Because everybody goes to that stage where they're completely tired and they're hallucinating, and you know what it's like with sleep de- de- uh, declaration. Yeah. Declaration. Yep. Yeah, I remember just watching this uh, this guy give me an in- interrogation, and literally his head just turned into Mickey Mouse because you were you were hallucinating. I'm like, God Almighty! So to me, that was the most difficult part. I thought, Wow, if this was at the beginning, I'd be out of here. But you know, this was <laughs> the last part of it, <laughs> and that was it. So I do believe it's it's a fantastic course, and I know. Your courses are very, very, very similar. We, we run them the same way, don't we? Uh, you do all the, these type of phases, go through the fitness phase, the mind game phase, and so on. But I do believe it does, it, it, it changes you, and it gets, they do iron out what's left of it. Right. They put a bunch of people together, and what comes out is something quite unique at the end, because everybody's the same, even though what David Staley, now a founding father, said, uh, this was the SASC force. And I only thought about it really once I got out in detail. He said every person who gets in the SES, they've got to have this. They've got to have classlessness, humility, integrity, pursuit of excellence, and a sense of humor. And I thought to myself, that is fantastic. You put them, them, them five points together. And so classlessness, that means you can work with people from different uh, backgrounds, different races, different religions, different... Uh, classes of society, you know, very rich people, poor people, but they're all in the same group. They all got that common goal. So you all get on. And if you've got this, not only in the special forces, it's a bonus for the rest of your life. No matter what job you're in, you could be working in McDonald's, nothing work problem with that. But if you can just go for that ethos, classlessness, and then humility, you know, nobody likes somebody who's just, you've got to be, you've got to be humble, you know, but you've got to be confident, but not arrogant. You've got to be a, 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 a normal oh, person, basically. And that's, that's life. And not everybody can get on with somebody, no matter what job. And then uh, integrity. Nobody likes a liar. You prefer a thief than a liar. And as you know, you've got to roll your hands up. Yeah, we all make mistakes. You've got to admit it. If you, for instance, everybody wants to go on operations. But if you were injured, you've got to... And nobody, people try and fake in. They'll do anything to, you know, take all them painkillers or whatever. They don't want that back start because they won't get on that operation. But they've got to hold their hand up and say no. This, or, for instance, we've had people on certain jobs pull out of a job and pull their team out because they could have got compromised. And that's a big no-no, but really, they did the right thing. But at the time, it was looked on as bad. You know, you've got, you've got, you've got to be honest. And integrity is massive and in any workplace. And then finally, the last two is pursuit of excellence. I always say, if you're going to be, I remember saying to me, and I've kept the same ethos, if, if you're going to be a, a Tom, which is a private, be a good Tom. So even though I joined as a sergeant, you go down to a trooper, and I found myself in, in the SES, you've been used to commanding 30 people. Next minute, I'm holding a pair of ladders, and <laughs> everybody's running up the building, and I'm the ladder, I'm the ladder holder. That was my job. Yeah. But I made sure that, he was the best ladder holder. You had the correct diet. You got there quicker and faster. You practiced on wherever you were doing it, on a coach, on a building, on a, you know. So no matter what job you're in, pursuit of excellence. If you're going to be a cleaner, be the best cleaner. Because somebody will notice you yeah. in that line of work. And just have pride in your job. If you're going to be a machine gunner, be the best machine gunner. And then finally, a sense of humor. And let's face it, you've got to have a sense of humor in life and, and, and no matter what. And... As you know, the military, we've got... It's a different type of sense of humor. Yeah. I, think, I think the closest to us is uh, emergency services and, yeah. and, and people like that. Fire yeah, it's fires, a dark which, humor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you've got to, aren't you? And, and like even the worst... Even in the most dangerous places and, and all... When, un, unfortunately, we've all lost uh, good friends. But it's the piss state. You, you just start having a laugh about all the the things what went on with this guy and all the all the you know mistakes he made all the problems we had and all the laugh together and you just sort of we call it taking a piss out of each other and so on it's that banter and Sevy Street it's a it's frowned upon a lot more but in in the in in the 
army, the special special forces, yeah, sense humor is massive. So I do believe that ethos is just it's fantastic in in any career. So that's what comes out of selection. They they do look for all this, and especially when they're in the jungle part. So you get all these guys together, and on ours there was two hundred started, and then at the end there were six SES soldiers, and then four SBS. So there's only ten of us, and and I remember looking at all the guys. And there was only one guy taller and bigger than me, and everybody else was just normal, normal mm-hmm. build or small and smaller, you know. And you're like, wow, just just the normal normal blokes get get through it. And uh, yeah, so I, I do believe it's a it's a great uh, selection process that our militaries go through to produce a special forces soldier. So after you go through selection, you complete your training. Uh, you land in D Squadron. Uh, I, I mean, you mentioned a little bit about how you went back down to essentially being like kind of a private in the SAS. Um, you know, starting like starting over from as a junior guy. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about like the culture of D Squadron? What it was like being in a team room with a bunch of like seasoned SAS operators? I mean, what was that experience like for you as a as a new new guy there? Oh God, it was it was really unusual at first because you you go in there, and I remember getting introduced to the sergeant major, and you're calling him sir, and it's like no, my name's he said his name, and you you yeah, and every now and again you're calling him no, don't 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 call me sir, it's none of that shit. And then I remember looking around the team room, and you think to yourself, you go and get there, and everybody's going to be really fit, and then I'm looking at, and there's all shapes and sizes. I'm like, wow, this just don't look like special, <laughs> you know, not my vision of a special forces guy but what you what I, I soon found out is you got guys who just come back from Northern Ireland where they've been playing uh, not playing uh, <clears throat> operational but blending in with with the IRA pretending to be a civvy and so on right so they, they make they make out like they like them and, and, and they sit in bars and all the rest of it and pe- people come from different posts and yet all these guys they were still would carry all that kit and there was still you know because there was no organized pt sessions you just have to keep yourself right fit and you could do the job so all these guys they could do the job but they were just all different shapes and sizes and that really shot me and also what shot me was when i first got there you hear about the squadrons and you think right you've got in the normal military you've got a command structure you've got the the company so many platoons platoon sergeants and so many commanders we get there and literally in some groups, there's only eight, and instead of 16, and then in other groups, there's 12. None of them, were, nobody was up to strength. And you could have so many sergeants and then just a couple of troopers, but they all just got on. Everybody had a, had a, uh, a, a role. And also, everybody had a say. I remember being there, and straight away, we were getting briefed for operations. And then the, the guys putting their words and the officers are talking about the plan and so are the blokes and then they go around the table and they ask they're asking me i'm like wow and and they ask every single person it doesn't matter if you've been the the newest guy or the oldest guy and they, and they, they take other people's opinions as well but obviously the book stops with who's ever in charge but that's what was really pleasing to see and then the amount of responsibility so you come out you start as a trooper but it's not that everybody sort of gets on you know the bosses and so on and then suddenly you get taken away. Okay, Mal, you and you now, you're going to go on this. You're going to go on this course next minute. You're away doing forward air controlling. And then next, and then you're away as an individual or just a pair of you. <laughs> You've got so much responsibility. You're, yeah. in, you're in charge of all this operational air where usually it's just a sitting officer in the RAF or in the artillery. And that's just their main job. You just get sent there just for a few weeks or a few months do it and a a couple of other guys will come and take over and so on and then you find yourself actually i've had to pinch myself i find myself like briefing a general and talking to a a general and you know he's pushing all these officers out the way and he come and he he come to where we were this was in bosnia and he and he come okay what's your name speaking to him and it's like yeah boss and right what do you think of it and what's your opinion and they were asking and you think to yourself god almighty you got that much responsibility but what i find it's more strategic responsibility was whereas before it's just it's mainly tactical responsibility you and your troops on the ground this was what you say and do it can go it can go all the way up to a very very 
uh, high standard. So, yeah, I I really enjoyed it. It was just it was just uh, something totally different. But what I always remember is, as soon as we passed, we've got a, we've got a clock tower, and it's a it's famous within Erifed in in the camp, and uh, it, it's known as you've got to beat the clock because since the Second World War, or I think there's only been one year, there's never been a name on that clock, and to get your name on the clock. You don't want your name on the clock because you've got to die either on operations or within training. And as soon as we got a berries, there was no big parade. It was just like, Chucky Berry, right, downs, you're going to the squadron, such and such, you're going to this squadron. And the officer who passed it out, I remember him saying, listen, enjoy it. It'll be over in an heartbeat. And then he said, and also make sure you beat the clock. And I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. And I was yeah. like, what, what's all this? But then, over the years, when you go back and you see that clock and then you know, you know all your mates, you've got that many different people you know on the clock and it's just like, wow. what a, And then, where did them 12 years go? You've had 12 years of being in... Because out of the 12 years I did in the SES, I had 10 of them years was just at the point of the... in the Sabre squadron, you know, at the point yeah. of the spear because you have four SES squadrons. You have A, B, D and G. And they all do the the same thing, they just rotate round, you know, going on operations, going on counter-terrorist and doing training and so on. But as you guys know, straight after, as soon as 9-11 happened, that was it. Instead of having, like, one group on operations, one group training, one group uh, on on counter-terrorism and so on, and you had a sort of a rotation, then it, that just all went out the window because operations is number one. So sometimes they'd be the entire... All the three squadrons were on operations, and you, no matter what, there'd always be one squadron that have to, would have to stay in the UK because they're the counter-terrorist right. squadron, right. just in case, right. you know, uh, a big terrorist incident happened and the police couldn't take it on, something like a uh, plane being hijacked or uh, something like the London, em- I mean, the embassy's the embassy, getting taken yeah. on. Yeah. So sometimes it was like obviously training and leave go out the winter just operations 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 but i enjoyed that i really did so so i found myself as soon as i got there i was what well, one of the first things i was doing was carrying the coffin of somebody who died uh, oh. from the squadron i didn't know him but he, he died on the only came in on he was on the selection before me i didn't know him but i found myself as part of the cof- uh, coffin bearing team because the lads most of the lads couldn't get back for the funeral i'm like wow and that just showed me how thick and fast it was. And nobody knew about this, yeah. obviously, because it's like secretive operations, what are going on and, and so on. But it was just a, uh, how can I say? It was something that was just, went, went so fast and at times so enjoyable. And as you know, you don't have time to really think about it until you leave the military. Yeah, yeah. And, and so on. But even me, I was very, very lucky, I think, because over, it's been over 40 years of either being in the British military, in the Special Forces, or training in small teams with Special Forces guys, or training Special Forces, uh, Foreign Special Forces. So I've always been with the, in that type of community. Yeah. And so I had a nice transition of going from once I got out, eventually uh, doing training for... Uh, foreign special forces which was great because you're just there training them and you're playing with weapons every day you you wake with like-minded people from the american special forces and uh australian special forces and british special forces and we all got on and we all team and and because talking of that i find the, the brits and the americans we've we've just got that common bond i remember going over to your the first time I ever worked with Americans was 1984 as a, in, a from an infantry unit. We went over to Fort Lewis in Washington, and it was the Airborne Rangers. Yeah. And God, I loved that place. And we ended up going there. Where was it? It's Ta- uh, Lake Tahoe. No, t- Tom, uh, n- Wait, near Lake, Seattle as well. Lake Tahoe yeah, is uh, down in n- Nevada. Yeah, Nevada, uh, California. Oh, yeah, I went there. That's a different time. But so, Tacoma, Ta- so you were in a... You Tacoma. Were in, yeah. Yeah, yeah you are in Tacoma, right? Yeah. And I remember going out to that camp, and I'm thinking, shit, because we, some, some, we have, like, garrison places, which are a bit bigger, but a lot of times it's just a battalion base, which is only 800 people, and then you've got just civvies around you. Your camp, that Fort Lewis, I'm like, God, it's like a city, and yeah. it was just so different than the British military camp and, and the food and everything else. It was just, oh, God. And I loved the training there, apart from, where did we go, Yakima, and it was winter survival. 
God almighty, it was cold. <laughs> but we went to Crystal Mountain and, and did ski and that. So that was my first look at the, the working and the, uh, the, uh, being involved like with the US. And I, I loved it. And then since then, we also, when we was back Germany, we used to go down to the PX and stuff like that. And even we used to do training in Canada. But the guys, we was right on the Canadian border, go down to Montana because we loved it. And then in the first Gulf, again, we did a lot of cross-training. And then once I got into Special Forces, one of the first things I remember, the team what was involved in uh, Black Hawk Down, they came d- across and gave us briefs. Because we always have cross-briefs together where you guys and other Special Forces units come across and I think we go across to your, yours and we give each other briefs and help each other out. So them guys came and that was really interesting. Then I found myself... Uh, going over to Fort Bragg, and again, what a place and massive, and working with the Delta guys, and it was the guys who was on, the, some of the guys who came and gave us this brief, they were doing these courses for us, because we liked the the uh, poor, poor smaller brothers, you know, we, you've got such great real estate and facilities, and we'd come across, for instance, when we practice of blowing aircraft doors, we put wood up there, and we got a, a metal uh, aircraft, and then we just blowing the wooden doors off. Come across to you guys and we're blowing proper aircraft doors off and not just one, two, three a day. And it's like, wow. And, you know, you've got all the facilities. So that, that was really good. And also, apart from working and uh, doing brag, and we do a lot of cross-training, a lot of your guys will come over to us. But also worked in, uh, that's where I got Tacoma, not Tacoma, uh, Ta- Lake Taha. Because we had we had a long weekend. We went to Nevada, just two of us. They sent just two of us doing some air controlling. And it was with the SEALs. And God almighty, you're, I remember doing forward air controlling in the UK. We've only got certain real estate where you can drop live. And you can only do certain runs. So it gets a bit boring. You go to America, you've got that desert. God, I remember we have like, got there. They had a built up area and they had two... 25 millimeter howitzers what with fire white phosphorus and you could use them to mark targets did have guys with stinger missiles so they could be Privacy. you know target the aircraft you, you'd have uh, what remote control tanks and they drop chalk bombs on it and they'd make a balsa wood village and then you'd bomb the fuck out of it <laughs> oh sorry for swearing and then next day you come back and you built a new one and it's like yeah. this is oh god the facilities were amazing so, yeah, it's great. And then, once I left the Special Forces, the very first thing I did was go out working for American News Crews, uh, crews with CBS News. So, with American uh, teams, but it was like, we were working with American media, but it was just all ex, a small team of four Special Forces guys. So, basically, I got out after, at the end of 2005, and I was in Baghdad, but when all that fell, and, you know, went across to the, the, the Second Gulf War, and went, in the desert, first of all, and then into Baghdad. And I remember then, say, in rotations, oh, this place, it's, it's a nightmare. I'll never be back here again. Lo and behold, 18 months after getting out, I'm, I'm, I mean, once I'm out, the very first job, I was out in Baghdad, the exact places that you were there before. But instead of being on the offensive, where you know it's dangerous, but at the end, you're going to have all the backup. You're going to have the, right. the medical support and everything. Yeah. You're on the defensive. You're just getting in there, doing the filming and getting out. But you're still armed and everything because... You try to blend in with the news crew, so you'd have your weapon and say a, a tripod bag, and obviously your pistol down your pants. And y- your job is to protect in the news. But some of them, some of the incidents what happened there, I could go on all, all night whoa, whoa, about whoa, it and whoa. how dangerous that was. I'll, I'll get I'll get into that, Melvin. I'd love to hear some of those stories. Um, but I, I would like to hear about uh, the 2003 invasion, the second invasion of Iraq. And what your experiences were like there with the SAS, uh, if you can tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, what I always remember is going back to that uh, the first Gulf War. I, I remember that people we were saying, "Oh, there'd be special forces behind there guiding them bombs on and so on." And they're like, "God, I, I want to do that one day." And then, lo and behold, it was the second Iraq War, and we were building up for it well before we knew it was going to happen. It wasn't. Uh, when I mean, if it was just when, but we just the beat up for it was such a long time, and we had certain squadrons. You know, certain squadrons were just their main jobs was just Afghanistan, and certain squadrons were just going to be Iraq, and so we had a good build up for it. So by the time we got over across there, it was it was to me it was it was a great finale because 
the original special forces was with David Sterling was as you know in the in the desert in the Second World War were going out behind enemy lines and doing all the raids and creating havoc. And basically that's what we were did. We went behind enemy lines, uh dropped off and got in all locate locations and then just created havoc uh, and did all the proper special forces stuff. So ambushes and raids. It was fantastic. So we did that and then our uh, squadron, we got pulled out of there because we were told, right, okay, Baghdad's falling. So then we pulled out and went straight into Baghdad. So we had like a fair bit of time doing full-on combat and but out in the desert, rural. And then suddenly there was conversion and you were doing now urban. Yeah. And, and this was like not just, you know, I've done urban before, but that was more undercover type of stuff and, and we've done stuff in Bosnia and so on. But this was something else because it was just literally as Baghdad had just fallen and it was like we got attached to these well uh was it the marine a marine unit but we, we was just doing around own thing we had that deck of cards that pack of 52 and it was a case of right we, we get we're going to get be getting these and sometimes you just have somebody coming in or, or they, they, they pass on to the military they think they know where such and such is or such and such a general or somebody from the bath pot and it was like right okay roll up and let's go get them. So we jump in your army in the Bradleys, your guys, the, the units we'd with, they provide the outer cordon, and then we'd go in and do the CQB because obviously we specialised in that uh, a lot with uh, on the counter-terrorist team. So that was like a speciality of ours. But it wasn't one. Sometimes you're doing two, three a day because you just have to go off hearsay. So you didn't have time to do all the plannings before you've been on jobs where you've had a lot of time to plan and you've been in Erifed and then flash the bang, you've You've gone away, done something, and back in 48 hours, there's been a lot of planning, a lot of uh, reports, and a lot of intelligence on the target you're going to uh, apprehend and so on. Uh, so it, it, it's usually like that. This wasn't any of that. It was a case of, right, a quick set of QBOs, quick battle orders. And sometimes we were just running, getting woke up. Okay, roll in. Right, I'll get my team together. And you just blah, blah, blah. And away you go, or you're shouting out what you're going to be doing in the back of the noisy Bradley, because it was that, you know, quick of the jobs. Because mm-hmm. you, you had to go. If somebody come up to the, the gate, they think they know where such and such is, then away you go. And obviously, a lot of times you get there, and they'd be the wrong place, or nobody's there, or they've just left. But then other times, we did get a few of them, and then other times, there was what the remainders who, who was there, just their bodyguards and that. So you just didn't know what to expect every time you, you went in the... So it was to me. It was a great sort of finale near the end of my career because you had the full-on uh, rural side of it, being behind enemy lines and doing that in the desert, and then going on and having all the urban side of it. So yeah, that was fantastic. And then, as I said, once I got out, I found myself straight back in Baghdad. But this time on the defensive, a lot more dangerous as well. I'd say. Were, uh, dur- during during that period of time in 2003, were there any particular like missions that kind of stood out in your mind? Is like this was really significant, or wh- whatever it was that kind of is prominent in your in your mind even today? Oh yeah, there was a, a fair few missions, and there was especially. Well, in both parts, on the rural side, when we was out in the desert, uh, because sometimes we literally went and did a reconnaissance to this area where we was going to call in some air on a certain t- objective one night, and we went to the the check of the area. Just you know, so many vehicles just rolled in there with all the MVGs, and it's just I remember thinking, I'm so tired. That I'm seeing things, and I, I thought I was seeing things moving on the ground. I thought, what's that? It's, it looks like it must be rabbits or something, because we were driving along. And, but we actually got on the road. That's how cocky we were and how full of ourselves. And we were just going along this, this road. And either side, I thought, I'm sure I've seen something on, on the ground. And I was just, I never said anything. And, but my, my driver and the gunner at the time, they were saying, they were, when we spoke about it after, they saw it things anyway what it was we went check this area out then next day we moved back to to do the task what we was meant to be doing like calling in there and no kidding you when the air came it was just bonkers we was just in a massive area we was in the middle of a a full-on position so these and i found i'll I'll tell you the story so we we got out of this position like what the hell was that and uh next day 
we get the report from the the predators what went over because we we're supposed to have the flyover, but the the US the, your your guys were using it and obviously it was your 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 uh, your resources. So then we sort of went in blind to where we went on target, and then next day they came and we got the full on report. One of the guys did who was doing the extra and off his and he had his laptop in in the uh, back. And basically, you could see everything. And we was inside a massive, massive position. Wow. So either side of the road, they could even show like four-man fire trenches. So what I thought was moving and what was on the ground was it was actually Iraqi Zeds popping up and then popping back down. You know? Oh shit! Because yeah, we we were just and because they didn't know who we were. Right. I think, and right, they were right. rear echelon. When we were trying to get out of it after we called in, because what happened was they actually. All the uh, anti-aircraft weapons, they started turning and firing on us as well. So I'm like, what the hell? We thought we was getting mortared, and then we, we get back on this road to get out of it. But then we saw Tracer coming across, not, you know, from the sides of us, and then we, you saw stuff coming over your head and landing in front of you, exploding. You think, shit, I've got to get through that. And you're like, what the hell was that, what we went through? <laughs> and, and then when we saw on the map where we were, you think, how the hell did we get out of there? It was just amazing. But then the next day they sent us back in a different area and do do the same again. Or and, <laughs> so yeah, there was some full on full on uh, contacts there, and again it's just by luck that you get out of these uh, these tasks. Don't you? And I'd say luck, but it's also good drills because everybody sure. yeah, knows yeah. exactly what they're doing and moving and so on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as for being overpowered, we was you know definitely a small fish in a big sea, and then. Yeah, there was many jobs of them once we went on inside the city itself. And obviously, I'm not allowed to say who we got, but we got some big targets and we missed some targets just by, you know, literally yeah. minutes, 20 minutes, yeah, you reckon. Yeah. We could have got some big ones. But yeah, some, some full on jobs there. How, how was it for you working with, you know, whether they were active or, or National Guard, the, the armor units? that were there to provide you guys cordon and support and things like that. Um, was that a learning process for you guys, or is it, is it something that you were, had already been trained up on? No, uh, to tell you the truth, I found myself, having been years ago in the armoured, the mechanised unit, armoured infantry unit, you know, I, I organised, I, I knew the, the, the tactics of armour. I've worked with armor before, but in special forces, we, we don't, we'd never worked with armor before. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of learning care, but we, they, they went out their way to facilitate it. And yeah, we, we got, it was, it worked very, very well. I must admit, you know, yeah, working with the, the uh, US, not, it wasn't just US special forces, we worked with the US, uh, was it the Marines and then also with their army, you know? Yeah. Well, every every unit we work with is just so facilitating. It's, it's brilliant. We really got on well. Yeah. And then uh, after the invasion of Iraq, uh, you went to a special wing of the SAS in 2004? Yeah, I went, I went to a special wing. It was, at the time, it was called FPW, which is Force Projection Wing. They've tamed, changed the name of it now, and that was like a specialist wing within the SAS. So I went to that. And that was just... And then after that, I really... That was when I was getting out, and I decided to get out. I did my time. I've done, you know, my full career, yeah. and I thought to myself, right, do I stay here now? Or do I get out? I make get out, and then he said, right, come on, this job, working with the the news, which was great because I said to my wife at the time, one was my girlfriend. I said, right, listen, you've been used to me being away for months at a time, and and being away in dangerous areas now i'm going to carry on going away and it's a dangerous area obviously looking after the press and in baghdad when it was really dangerous then and uh, just a small team and i says however we're getting money for it this time but the difference was if something would have happened like a couple of years before and you was over there fighting for a country it would have been a case of right sas guy dies in hero he died in iraq but then if anything happened to you there it'll be okay He's a mercenary. He didn't even have to be out there. He's just just after money. And but people don't realise you still, you still got to look after your families. And that's what, that was like, like what people were doing. But majority guys, let's face it, they go out and we call it the circuit. They go on, 
and start jumping on the PSD teams and getting on these like uh, military type contracts and and looking uh, doing PSD and and as you know when it starts when the, at the beginning there's big money in that and let's face mm. it you've still got to look after your family and everything so and plus I was just working with all D squadron guys not only SS guys but they were all ex D squadron so I was working with the four guys who we all knew and all mates and we just rotate yeah. so for ten months a year I was in in Baghdad. Uh, looking after the news but i got on really well with obviously all the news crew and then it, you did actually so you had time to adjust and see the different side what yeah, the yeah. iraqis were, were doing because i worked with iraqis all the time as well and and you realized that then as it went on the devastation what we caused and, and how they really wanted us there but then later on they were they were if, over the years because i had four years there they were saying at least with Saddam, you, we knew he was a terrible dictator and they hated him. And some of them had had family killed, but they said they prefer have him back there now instead of at least they, they could get the kids to school, they could go to a market without it getting blown up and, and so on. And it was, it was really, it was, I found that quite a difficult period as well because you were just working with a small man, four man group, but also all the, the American news teams what used to rotate through. You got to know them really well. Yeah. And unfortunately, we we lost, you know, good friends out there. We dropped them off on, on an embed with the American military, and they went on an embed, and there was a big car bomb there, and we had, had two good friends killed uh, outright, and then one of the, the main correspondents, she was badly injured. And then we had a few Iraqi friends who you got to know over the years. They bring you treats when they had a baby from their family, but most of the time they spent in the hotel with you because obviously it was a danger for them to uh, be back home and when they did go back home nobody knew who they were working with but sometimes it got, the word got out they got followed so we had a, a couple of them over the years got kidnapped then mm. killed tortured and killed yeah. and you knew these people so it was like god almighty that, that was that was quite intense but then after that uh, yeah, I, I finished that after about four years and I'm like right because we had a four year plan me and my wife I said now I'm going to go to just go on a normal circuit and sort of just do normal celeb work and bits of uh, ship security. So I did that just for a few months. But then I got a great job with uh, working with the special forces, training special forces out in the United Arab Emirates. So I was working out there uh, with like-minded people, guys, lots of uh, SF and the, all, the, all the American special forces guys. And yeah, we were just training them, so that was a really great transition. Yeah. So I did that for at the, at the well, something like eleven years. Yeah. So by the time and then I finished that, and w once I finished that, I uh, just uh, I, I then started doing stuff like a bit of body bodyguarding out over there, looking after billionaires. I even looked after JC and uh, Beyonce when they did the big comeback concert in, in Dubai. <laughs> and that was brilliant, you know, just for because I obviously knew Dubai. So I was like, they had their own team come over, obviously, right. but he was, you know, a couple of doors away from and he was really all around them. So that was, that was great. And then I went to Turkey again with the news crews, uh, just as the earthquake happened, like this time, that, no, a year February gone, and we was actually there when one of the uh, the second earthquake happened, and that was an eye opener as well. And you saw, you know, all the humanitarian problems, what was going on. And then since then, since I've been back UK, I've been doing a lot of uh, charity work for veterans, especially homeless veterans, because there's that many homeless now in my own city and around the uh, UK. So I'll be doing charity work, but also a lot of public, and now I'm starting to do public speaking. And I've also went to Ukraine as well on a humanitarian aid uh, charity event as well, because I'm a big believer that we should be back in Ukraine because they're fighting on our behalf. So, you know, I'm keeping myself busy now. I'm going to start doing a lot of uh, public events and talks because what we don't realise and you keep shy about is... Yeah, it's 40 years of either being in the military or special forces or, right. or you know, you've, you've had all that. But with that comes an awful lot of experience and not just military experience. Right. We've got life experience, haven't we? We've right. got an awful lot of life experience. And we ourselves and uh, emergency workers, we've we've gone through it quite a lot more than a lot, lot of people. Right. And so I think if we can show people 
how to be a, a lot more resilient because let's face it, we've all gone through social issues, we've all gone through emotional issues, financial issues, psychological issues, physical issues, and the idea is you, you just it's just like a military assault course. You're going to problem when everything's going all right, bang, something else will happen and it's just be resilient. So I, I do believe with people with our sort of background can pass this on, put on our knowledge and actually help not only the other veterans, but other uh, the civilians going through all this, especially now in UK, there's a cost of living crisis and there's a lot of the uh, better fighting. It seems to be going backwards to me. It's like going back to the 1980s. It's as, yeah. if, it's as if the governments want in fighting. They don't want people to look up where the problem is. They just want people yeah. fight against each other and they're causing all the problems. And, and so I just want to do, you know, a bit for a bit play my part and if i can help i, w I will help but also um, i'm also just going to be writing a book as well because mm -hmm. every subject i've touched on there's not this is just quickly going through it yeah but yeah. there's a massive there's a massive part of that i could just talk about one tour of duty in northern ireland the first one i could talk about that for about you know four or five hours and have you just just to tell you how confusing that that was and so on because even I know while I've heard and I've spoken to other Americans, they, they see something like Northern Ireland differently than what we see it as a British soldier. You, you're over there and it's part of Great Britain. It's part of your Northern Islanders. It's part of the UK. And, you know, I know I, whatever the politics are and everything, uh, that's that. But you were there to protect all sides. Catholic and Protestant, you're there to protect people. But I remember going there in the early 80s. I remember the Catholics at the time, they, they do, you can't see a, a Catholic area. It was more run down. They did seem to have the worst end of the stick, so to speak. Uh, and then it was just human nature. You, you got on more with the uh, Protestant side because they liked, they all liked the military. Right. Whereas as mainly the Catholic side didn't like the military, not all of them. But obviously, it's more percentage than that. And I remember at the time that they were saying to me, "Why are you here, soldier boy?" And they, they say that to everyone. But they stopped me a few times, in particular, and especially because of being black. They're saying, "Why are you here?" Because at the time in UK, right, there was right, a lot right. of riots going on. They're saying they don't even want you. You you were the you were the suppressed in the UK. People yeah. don't want you in that country. And they go right. And this was the Catholics saying to me, and we're the same. We're we're the suppressed. We just want fair rights and so on. And so it got you thinking. You're like, God, I'm just trying to do a job. And you know, <laughs> you're you're a 19 year old, and you yeah. just, you just want to look after everyone. So that was such a confusing place. And then even going back the second time and third time, <laughs> even though. You've got command. You've got command responsibility. It's still uh, very, very confusing, and it's, and it's. I think it's confused everybody. Yeah. Uh, no, even I'm, still, sort of that political part. I, I'm curious about your take on the whole resiliency issue, because it's obvious that you know, the military and, and the special operations courses, that they test you for resiliency. Do you think so? It's not that they necessarily train you to be resilient. But their selection courses find the people who already are resilient or are predisposed to it. Do you feel that there are lessons? And if so, what are those lessons that, that where you can take that and teach people how to be resilient? Yeah, I, I do. Life's lessons. You know, I always say you, you, they'll wonder if somebody said, and I'm, I remember saying it, like you, you grow through what you go through. Everything I say, there's a positive in everything. Even I, I, I will never ever moan about. Okay, yeah, I got bullied. I, I didn't get this job, or something happened. Yeah, we have our little problems, but to me, like I said, getting bullied that made me definitely made me more resilient because you you had to do you had to you, what you what you do. You've got to face up to a bully, and that made me now always say right. You, <laughs> for instance. It's like a storm, a, a sandstorm saying the bar, you can't outrun it. You're better off just standing and just going through it the opposite yeah. way. And as soon as you get through it, that's it. You, you're over and done. If you try outrun it, you're just going to wear yourself down. Eventually, it's going to get catch you up. You can't, you can't outrun problems, and they're always going to be there. You've just got to face them. And, and let's face it, there's that many 
uh, veterans who've gone through all these life problems. So not only are you doing a dangerous job and you, you're <laughs> we're going through all that type of emotions, which it doesn't take you until years later, let's face it, a lot of times. But then you've just got normal life problems, you know. I went through emotional problems, a bit of divorce at a young age, and then having have to, with kid, a kid involved and, you, and then still trying to do your job. And and then, so, and, and also went through financial problems then. I went from before, I remember starting the military career, and I remember my dad at 16 gave me a few pounds. So I started, you jump in, the military, you're it. You've got a bed block and itchy blankets, as you know, and there you are. You're just a number. But I had a couple of pounds. Roll on. 16 years later, I've gone through a bit of divorce. I'm a corporal. Yeah, I'm 50,000 pound in debt because of <laughs> yeah. because of things that <laughs> went on. It wasn't my problem. So not only emotional problems, you're trying to sort yeah, out yeah. financial problems. But right. it's hard. It's it's life is hard, isn't it? And it's your, you've got to choose the hardness. It's either savings hard, let's face it, but getting in debt's hard. But uh, you have to just like so that. I dug deep. I, I, I nearly went the other way, for instance, because I remember now I'm 32, gone through 16 years later, I'm rolling in into a base, and I was like, shit, I haven't got a bed block, but I've just got, you know, I've got a quilt. I've got my own little room, and you've got all the lads who are single and that living in the room, or some of them, I mean, in the, in the building, some of them divorced. I'm like, shit, I am now like I was at 16, but at least then I had a few quid in my pocket, whereas yeah. now I've, I've got 50 grand of debt, and I've got right. a lot of right. that's all going on back home, and I've still got this military career to get on with, and all your mates want to do is just take you out and get you pissed. Yeah, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And say, so, yeah. oh, forget the world. And you can you can get into that uh, when you get the time, obviously, because you're way busy. But when you aren't, that's what I can see how people could hit the bottle, could put that gun to the head, because you know it. Emotional problems, guys can get through uh, other problems and and grief and and, and other military type issues. But then suddenly you get hit with emotional problems, family problems. About there, it can we terrible things on, on your mind but I went the other way I thought right okay I know which way this is going to go if I just hit the bottle and just trying to go and be bitter and twisted I just went right bang fitness 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 I'm in a base it's got a gym open 24-7 I just happened to be on the counter-terrorist team so I was based in UK and was busy I just like just did any time I, I had before work I'd be in the gym after work, I was in the gym back in the night, and I was just a gym bunny. And, it, and it, over the, the months, and then it, I got on a, a particular good job, a way working, but it saved the money. And, and eventually I got out of that. And as you know, you can get out of that rut. So financial ruts and, as I said, social ruts at the beginning was all, you know, it's part of life. Uh, yeah, that's either bullying or sexism or whatever. It, it's always, somebody don't go, to me, there's always haters in this world. Somebody yeah, might yeah. not like you because you're a football team because of the the colour yeah. Yeah. I've always had I've always had the mentality, like my dad says, you get on with people. It doesn't matter. It's, I was brought up on a large white estate. Some of the best mates were white. And I've seen prejudice the other way as well. You know, it's it's not, don't don't I think now people sort of make big problems out of little problems. They seem yeah. to we we we're in a culture where everybody's saying, Oh, He's done that. They're looking to blame somebody instead of just saying, right, I never got that job. Okay, it might have been because I was not good enough. No, it's because I, I was a woman, because I'm overweight, because of this, that and the other. Just Sometimes you just got to admit it. And that, yeah, if something's wrong, shout it out, stand up for yourself. But I always see the best in people and, and take every, everything uh, in context. For instance, I not long ago went back to this village and I had a, a woman talk to me and she actually called me like by a, what was it? Something like, what did she say? And uh, yes, and she was really old, and she's like, and um, and I used to have a, a negro live live by me one time, and she's talking like that. And I was thinking, I'm like, God, that was just because she's no woman. She she lives in this village. She hasn't seen it. And to her, she's back in them days. She could have dementia or something. You know what I mean? And it's stuff. I, I even I get confused. I I was a scout leader. For my, my, in Dubai for the British scouting overseas because my son, he went to uh, the Cubs. I remember filling this form and now I haven't been back to the UK for a long time. And it said, right, 
you had to say description of yourself or whatever, and he's ticking a box, and it said, black, British, uh, Caribbean, mixed race, <laughs> mixed ethnicity. I had about 10 different... I'm like, I'm just a bloke. I'm a We're a yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what am I? And I actually said to someone, I goes, no, I'm off cast. And this guy goes to me, you can't say that. This white guy, he goes, if I said that, I'd get, you know, I'd lose my job. I goes, what do you mean? He goes, that went out about 20 years ago. I goes, no, well, it's, what is it? Is it mixed race? And he goes, no, you are now in UK BAME, which is black, Asian, minority, ethnic. That's what a, a black person called in UK now, BAME. I'm like, what the F what is, is BAME? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, hang on now, who says this? Who has, who has labeled me? Who says you are now BAME? You can't be black anymore. You can't be colored anymore. Yeah, you can't be yeah. offcast anymore. You are now BAME. Who, who comes out with these words? And if I didn't know this, then other people don't know. You know, you, you, you just don't know what to say in that anymore. And it's not moaning. It's just like I have to have a giggle about it because to me, You've got, as I said, just there's a positive in every everything. I get up in the morning and, and my wife says I'm like a a, a, a puppy because as soon as it's light, I'm up and I want to get out. I don't care if it's raining or whatever. I like to get out and do some type of fitness. I just do. And just to me, it's positive. I'm up. I'm awake. I want to do something. We, we're humans. We're bodies. We're meant to be moving. And, and that's always been my attitude. So we have got an awful lot of resilience to pass on to people, especially in the civilian population now. I think the, I know everybody says the generations are getting weaker and easier, but <laughs> they are getting weaker and easier. And it's just like, sometimes you want to just to get grip people and say, right, just common sense. Come on, let's call it out. And just, you know, people get on. We all know what's wrong, what's right. But give people the benefit of the doubt. Not yeah. every time they're trying to... Uh, they're trying to cause problems for you. And, and I think a lot of the times it comes from above. They just want to create problems. I think there's a, not, not so much in UK a, a race problem. I think it's a class problem. Mm. That's the biggest problem. People coming up there, growing up on the class. Because as I said, I grew up in a, a white working class. I was going to say, not just as bad as if you was in a black council area where there's a lot of black people. It's all the same. They're all going for these same problems. They're all skint. They all haven't got much money. They all... Right used to have jump in the same bathtub and use the same water, you know. And it's yeah. just that. Just people are people. Get on with people. And life, there's always going to be problems in life. But you just got to get over them, aren't you? Yeah. And like you said. And to me, looking back, I got back in touch with my, because I lost touch with my old unit my when I was first in the military. But then I've recently got back in touch with lots of people, especially moving back to UK. And I remember seeing a uh, platoon, a platoon photograph, and somebody's telling me. And then looking at the guys, I'm like, "Wow, he committed suicide. He committed suicide. He committed suicide. He is now uh, lost. Not lost the plot. I say lost the plot, but you know, uh, he's he's always in and out. It means sex sections. He's really had m yeah, mental, yeah, serious mental problems. And I've got a few of them. And I look at this platoon, and there's that many of them. And a couple of got guys have gone in prison. I'm like, "Wow, that's not." If you get 30 guys from just a normal area of society of that class, say, in, in, the, in, the, in a different job or different yeah. uh, in that factory, and you all got together years later, it wouldn't be like that in the military. But if you look at it in the military, it's, it's, it's sort of mirrored in, in, in every unit. That's what it's like in the British military anyway. There's that many uh, veterans suffering, especially... Uh, the the suicide rates, and I know it's the same in the, in in America or even worse in America. Yeah. I think it'd be worse in America because let's face it, you've got weapons so easily at hand. Yeah, and there's been times here, you know, when you can you can see you, people have actually said they have really had bad times, and if they they just wanted they could felt like topping themselves, but it's a bit more difficult just to walk out. <laughs> and walk in front of a train or bang right. yourself then if you've got a pistol there and you're really depressed and bang so yeah, yeah I can a, see how a, that uh, happens more a really grim sort of statistic uh, that I've been told is you know American soldiers when they you know sadly take their own lives in the, in the United States it's usually a firearm you're, you're right but then when you see when they're deployed overseas to places like Japan uh, they're in Okinawa suddenly it turns to hangings um 
and yeah, it, it's it's sad. Um, and I I think we could do a much better job with it. Yeah, and and I think, and especially our, you know, our governments. But I I do know for a fact your veterans, you you are looked after a lot better yeah. than the British military veterans, your, your VA, uh, your, your medical cover. And and Cause like, like I said, for the last 11 years, I was working with, uh, it was basically a American military consultancy firm. So I was working for a military, uh, a private and it was called Shamal solutions and it's military consultants. So I was employed by an American firm, but it was like, ex-British special forces as well mm. as American special forces mm. from all the different special forces groups and then some other guys and depending on what job you were doing and speaking with you guys and about the different pensions and about the veterans and about how you you get looked after and other armies it's uh let's face it it's 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 quite disgusting and what gets me though is the British public they it's that they look after the British vets more than anybody else that it's the charities because the British public love 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 they the love military, the military yeah. and it's as if the government say, "Well, we know that the, the, their own people, the, the they will they will provide charities for them." It's like I just did recently a sleep out for the homeless, for veterans and stuff like that, and uh, you know you're raising money. That just local communities are for their own, uh, not just veterans but homeless. And this is in this isn't modern society. It shouldn't be going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The government should step in and fill that role rather than just relying on charities to do it. Um, but no, it, it is good to hear though that the that the British public and is is so supportive. I, I remember walking around London and like going into bookshops, and it's like America in the sense like there's be, be like a whole display of books of like how awesome the British were in World War II. It's yeah. like, it's clear that there's that, that affinity is there kind of the same way it is in, in the United States. But the only thing, one thing what really gets me though is uh, what I find about in the States is the flag. You love you, that's you, that's your country, that's your culture. It's flown everywhere yeah. in the States. In, in the UK, people, oh God, they seem to get annoyed. I've got my flag, but I've got a flag post Outside my house, a pole with my, my flag, the, the Union flag flying. I think everybody showed that. It's just that over the years, I don't, you had years ago, you know, small right wing uh, units who used to walk, walk, have the Union Jack and try and kidnap that Union Jack and say it's like uh, <laughs> fascism. And I was a young soldier then. I'm like, no, no. You know, this was back in the day. They'd have like National Front marches and everything. I'd see these guys and, and all that and just just a bunch of thugs basically and then carrying that union jack but that didn't stop me wearing a pride that's my union jack and yeah. then you've got like the far left people saying oh the union jack that represents slavery and the, the empire and and what happened you 250 years ago I'm like come off it how stupid you know it's in the word in empire. You, you don't get an empire by uh, just saying, excuse me, can I take over that? You know what I mean? That's, that, that's how it was. Yeah. Get over it. But yeah. it's our country. We should be proud of our country. And, and most of the population are. And it's just that, I don't know, a few politicians, they just want to not please everyone. They, they seem to want to please the minority, you know, or I, I don't know, some sit minority who say we shouldn't be having the, we shouldn't be celebrating our culture or celebrating uh, being being who we are, so, uh, being uh, having an empire. Yeah, we had an empire. So what? People, there's, there's some talk about taking out the British Empire medal. How pathetic, just because it has empire in. It's, yeah. it's I don't know. It's as if people are looking for problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. And if they've got I, I, no pro they've go, got no problems. Yeah, they've got to, no yeah. problems go back and There's no problems the happening past, now. Yeah. Why are you yeah. going back two hundred years look for problems? If yeah. you went back <laughs> Yeah, yeah we, back got 20, yeah. we got enough. We got enough today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no problems getting out of the now. So, you know, have a laugh about it and just enjoy life and have a positive about everything and just see the best in everyone. You know, your mate's your mate no matter what. There was, uh, there was one, one subject that I kind of uh, missed uh, uh, as we were talking, Melvin, that I wanted to go back and hit up with you, which is the, uh, the hunt for the Pifwicks in, uh, in the Balkans, 
which was uh, you know a pretty righteous mission that you guys did going after war criminals. Um, could could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, most of my time has actually been in in the in the units is in the in the special forces. It's either after you've you've dealt with it's either terrorists and insurgents, enemy combatants, or pithwicks, and that's persons indented for war crimes. And these people, God, the what they the, the atrocities they did in in uh, Bosnia, you know, uh, this is not just the Bosnian Serbs. It was the 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 Muslims, the Croats, they all did it, but yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. the Serbs are the bigger, the bigger party. And it just shows you where neighbours can be getting on for generations, then suddenly it's, you know, something happens and then there's that divide, what starts again and it's a build-up from the past and then something happens to that person and they have to take retaliation and before you know it, they're chopping people's heads off and there's mass murder going on. And it was terrible, and yeah, so persons indented for war crimes, we actually, uh, we we took out a lot of them and captured a lot of them, and we had specific missions, and yeah, that was, yeah, really, really interesting work. But usually, on them type of jobs, you knew well in advance what your target, so there wasn't, you know, you had a lot of planning time for it, and then away you go, and I remember being on a job where literally you, you, you're just waiting for it to go down, and then I was shopping in the supermarket, then you get the call, then you're in the camp, and then flash the bang, you've gone away, 48 hours, you're back, and I'm watching soccer on TV, and yet you've been involved <laughs> yeah, yeah. in a really, a full, you know, uh, a really uh, intense mission and, and that. So that was that was the difference. You would just be banging in and out, in and out. Are, are there any jobs. any of those captures that kind of like really stand out in your mind? Yeah, there's a there's a few a few of them. To tell you the truth, you know, uh, yeah, there, there's and sometimes you have to. I don't know. Obviously, I've got, I can't say names and all that because it's endangering it's endangering myself and that. Sure. But there's been yeah, no. there's been okay. times when literally. I've been in a task where I've had to use my weapon like a modern day club because you've done everything in your power to apprehend somebody, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that's what you can, that's really close and personal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but they, as, as I said, they got their just deserves the, the, uh, Pethwicks. and it, it's going to happen again, isn't it? You, you, there's there's it that many. Like it. Pipwick's going on around the world now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's face it. <laughs> God. Yeah. And then there was, there was many other different missions. But like I said, it's just like, before you know it, I remember joining in 94, and then beginning in 95, we was on a counter-terrorist team, and then we just get told, okay, this weekend, because you always work in the weekends, because that's when the police get their overtime, and you you go down and you practice on... The, on the uh, all the embassies, you practice in the main areas where you think it's going to get taken on. You go to the main airport, you practice on the main airport, so you know when if there's a big terrorist incident, you know where to go, and you know you have to practice on different planes, trains, and everything. That's mm -hmm. that's common knowledge, and just in case there's a major incident in the UK. So this weekend, before we was having off next minute, we was told no, you, you're not. Uh, we, we, there's no this. This weekend, we thought it was one of the only weekends we were going to be working, and then, and the reason was because it was Princess uh, Diana and Harry and mm -hmm. William, so it was one of their birthdays. So they'd just come down to the Airy Fed, and then you take them all out and show them all their stuff and that. And they were they were regular visitors, the royals, there uh, for that. But it was amazing because you're like, oh, okay. Next minute, you're, you're chatting to Princess Diana and teaching the <laughs> kids stuff, and, and you're doing live. Live showing them live uh, CQB and stuff like that. You like you just don't get that normal, you should, normal, yeah, you normal you army on the weekend with a day's no with two days notice. You shared that picture with me, didn't you? Yeah, that 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 was the one in nineteen ninety five. Uh, yeah. So did did uh, did Princess Diana do any of the stuff in the shoot house where you had to go in and rescue her? Yeah, no, they they were all just watching, and it's really they were watching, it's really yeah. funny because the watchers all go in, and you know it's live rounds. Mm -hmm. So you have, you've got live ammunition there, and there's no safety on. You've got your safety off because obviously the and it's just showing you. And uh, 
when they've got all targets up and obviously there's rubber walls, so you go in there and you fire and, and so on, and you do it nice and fast. And then, then what happened with us, then they, they turned all the lights off and they were explaining, they changed the targetry around and they were explaining to the princess and everything. Uh, and also we can do this every night. And as we're talking, we all go in this time with our night vision goggles and everything on. So you've got your lasers. Mm -hmm. And I remember going in there, I've got live ammunition. And 20 meters in front of us is the princess and the, <laughs> and the kids. And you're walking towards them. And then I turn I turned to my target. And they say, SES stands for, and the officer was talking. And so they obviously they come to you. They're like, you know, they don't know. And they, they were just saying... Imagine now we kill all the lights and they're talking. And the, and the officer said, SES stands for speed, aggression, and surprise. And on surprise, it's boom, bang, double tap, <laughs> you know, with silences. And then the lights come on, and there you are. And it's like, ooh, shock effect. But to, to me, it was like going through, I've got my laser, and, I'm, I'm, it, you know, I, I'm like, wow, no safety catch on. And then there's the princess and the, and the two <laughs> princes. <laughs> you imagine that? I always imagine if I tripped over, that wouldn't have gone down well, would it? <laughs> uh, no, Melvin, uh, another, another question I'd, I'd love to ask you, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit uh, earlier on, like the question of, uh, or, or the, the, the subject of race in the SAS. Um, I'd love to hear, like, were there any situations where being a black dude was like advantageous to you as a SAS operator, where your no. ability to blend in or relate to people? No, what it what it was. These very very few uh, British born black people in the yeah. SAS. Very very few. Yeah. There's a few few guys like because of um, uh, the fathers say it might have been a Fijian in, and it's it's come down the family lines, and these sure. family south in, and and sometimes you get ex. Uh, New Zealand SES, sometimes they come on our course and get in and they like a Maori type. So you, mm. you do have a few, a, a few different uh, shades in there. However, when, once I got to the SES, there was ne never any racism whatsoever. Ne I never seen it felt it or anything. As I said, it was just going on that course and that was just one, one guy giving us a comment, you know, a little racist guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you get that everywhere. And, and you know, that's never going to change. And, uh, it's, he could, I could have had ginger air and he could have been saying, right, there's ginger or whatever. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, just but life. I, I or, mean, I, w I was curious if it ever, like, played in your favor. Like, they said that you wouldn't be able to blend in Northern Ireland, of course, but other parts of the world, oh, you can yeah, blend yeah. in where oh, a white sorry. guy can't. Yeah, yeah, Jack, there's been times like that. We've worked out, we've worked in the foreign countries, you know, in Africa and places like that where even though, they know you're on Africa, but yeah, you definitely do. You're working with other uh, people from there, and yeah, it can go in your favor because they see you as not one of them, but you're more looking like one of them, you know what I mean? Right, and, yeah. And so on. So, yeah, def definitely can go in your favor as well. So, yeah. But as, as you know, uh, part of our job is also training all different special forces. I've trained many, many of them. So, you get into you get in with different cultures and as you it's art and mind that's what really helps and that's that's great how the special forces are experts and that because as you know if you can win somebody's arts and minds you you've got such a bonus you've got a, an ace you've got an ace in your and your pack of cards aren't you you know they can give you information and tell you and then it's again you've got the responsibility of making that mistake and killing the wrong person uh, by mistake, not by mistake, or somebody in that village, and that's it. You've turned everybody against, or it can go to strategic levels if you drop that bomb in the wrong place. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's an awful lot of responsibilities. Do we but, have uh, yeah. questions yeah. for uh, Melvin at all? Yeah. Uh, uh, we just have, I think, one. Uh, let me check. I have well, a question. I, okay. Uh, actually, it's not even a question. It's just, uh, M. Corbin, thank you very much for the donation. Be sure to hit that like button. Uh, what do you got, D? Uh, hey, Melvin. Um, I'm Dimitri. I'm the producer. I got a question about the MP5. Did you like it? Did you hate it? Tell me about it. Yeah, the, the MP5, back in the day, I liked. You know, with, with the suppressor. Yeah. It was... <laughs> you, you had a few stoppages, but I, I, I personally liked it. The South I thought it was all right. I know people don't like it, most people, but yeah, I found it, it was okay back for, in the day. For, for best, room, best room clearing or aircraft takedowns or what, what role do you think it, it fit into? 
yeah, it was the, the room clearing and aircraft takedowns because at the time it was like the nice small weapon and, and doing all your VIP drills as well because then, you, you know, it could be slot down nice and easy into a collapsible backpack and into your, your small bags and everything and into the car fitted while in for car drills, especially the MP5 short. short. Yeah. So, yeah. And, that, and that's a great thing about the Special Forces, isn't it? You're not just... You're not just uh, one minute you're doing, we're doing an Arctic and then you're doing a bush exercise, you're doing a jungle exercise, you're doing a desert. You're just all over the place. And then you're on the counter-terrorist team, so you're doing the civilian side of stuff. And then suddenly you get taken away. Not only that, I've been a member coming from a jungle exercise, and then literally a day later, you're in, suited and booted in, in civilian clothes looking after really diplomats in a, in a really high risk area you know again armed and you, you, you're in civvy so you do all the uh, vip type of courses and drills and that so it's such a we used to say we were like jack of all trades master of none you're just constantly on the go right yeah it's brilliant brilliant yeah uh one other one from mc Cor uh m corbin thanks again uh do you have a favorite challenge coin pardon do you have a favorite challenge coin coin Coin. Do, are coins a thing that you guys do in the UK? The, oh, the challenge do you mean coins? like the, the, these type of? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We we got these. My my favorite coin is obviously these are one for each squadron. That's my that was my squadron. So that's awesome. You'd have the SES badge on at the back. Yeah. And then you've got that's D squadron, and it, that's represent that represent uh, represents D squadron, and then you've got <laughs> say this is. B squadron. And this is an easy one. That's A squadron. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is G squadron because it was God's squadron. And on the back, you got these coins. But I've got I've got loads of coins because I, I know this was a big. It was it's really big in the in the American military, yeah. isn't it? And I remember over the years, yeah, getting given coins. We never did in yeah. the UK. Uh, we should do, but. Yeah, but what, what is the? the uh, could you exp explain if you if you know the the symbolism of the torch on the D Squadron coin? Well, it's not a torch. It's actually this. It's actually a dag it's a dagger, and it's from the Malayan conflict. Ah, where okay. D Squadron. Yeah, and a, and a, uh, this famous conflict in uh, the Oman, mm -hmm. where a, a small group of SAS that they 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 withstood like against. Lots and lots of uh, rebels, and th this was all secret. Yeah, and it was D Squadron. Yeah, yeah. This is the D Squadron who was who was the main ones, and he's uh, a famous guy. And he was from Fiji, and he st stood his ground, and he he just kept on firing this uh, mortar and a uh, uh, machine gun, and unfortunately he died. And we got a statue of him. So that's yeah, that's that's was D Squadron. So that's why we got that's that. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Hey, hey, what about the uh, the the tick or the the the, 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 the squadron? Fat, the, the scorpion tick for a squadron. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> tell you the truth, I've got no idea because that's a squadron. <laughs> I don't really know. And it's the same with the claw for B squadron because it's it's really weird because you've got A B D G. We all right. do the same thing. We all saber fighting squadrons, and then with each squadron, you've also you've got like your air troop, your mobility troop, your boat troop. And your mounting troop, and that's just an insertion skill. You mostly work as a squadron, yeah. so you're all doing the same things. You rotate, but they're so different. The squadrons are so different. B squadron, throughout my time, and even now, I know people are still there. They still say that's like the fun. They're a bit more chilled out. Yeah, they're a bit more laughable squadron. D squadron I was in, it was always classed as a bit more formal. Yeah, and it, and it used to be. And then A squadron, they just weirdos. Everybody calls yeah. them the strange, the strange blokes, and uh, that's that. And the guard squadron. Because we were ex guards, they seem a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more it, it, arty tarty, but they aren't. But they're all the same. But what it is, I do believe, is certain individuals when they get to that squadron who were the the sergeant majors and that they they look out for their the people and they sort of mentor them and they've got to be that type, same character. So for B squad, they've got to be more of a, a chilled, happy go lucky. And you find all their ex sergeant majors were and are. And and so that makes more of a chilled, happy-go-lucky sort of squadron. But 
everybody does the same job. And it's so the same. I remember a B squadron because, like, I mean, D squadron. They said we are more formal. And I, re- I remember one time he was on a counter terrorist team, and we were firing all these rounds. I remember this officer saying, "Oh, great, we have fired like double the rounds that D squadron. I mean, that B squadron did on the build up to taking over the counter terrorist team." But I tell you what, they were just as good as shots than yeah. than us because, as you know. Yeah, you fire loads and loads and the most repetitive, but you, after a bit, you get that tired. Yeah. And yeah. then you, you start going down back. Diminishing yeah. returns. That's what yeah. we do. We just burn ourselves out. Yeah, they, would, yeah. they would do it to the right level. So, yeah, yeah we fired more shots, but that doesn't mean we're any better. We're all the same. Yeah. But it's, it's really weird how different squadrons <laughs> maintained that sort of uh, culture. Character. For, for, yeah, and it's been. Forever, for, for, you know, I remember when I got there, people who'd been in for donkey's years who were getting out and being, they used to say this has always been like this. And then you look through it, it says, and then I know people who've still been there since I've got out and have been there, for, you know, a long time and on 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 different type of jobs because you can keep stay active now in the SES up until sixty five. Obviously, not going operational, but training jobs. And they say, Mal, it's it's just the same. Yeah, obviously, the the. The equipment changes and that, but basically the soldiers, the, the man is just the same. The selection yeah. basically is hardly ever changed, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's face it, it's, it's, to me, now, it's te- technically, you've, you've got to be a bit more tech-minded. You've got, you've got to, yeah. aren't you? Because you've got to keep with the time, so we all would have been. Yeah. Uh, because it's all a lot more computers and it's all, you know, drones and everything and so on. But yeah, it, Milvin, I was just going to Go say on. that it's funny because we have that we have that same sort of thing in American special operations where, you know, it, it's the squadron or the company or whatever has a personality. Everybody knows what the other, <laughs> you know, components personality is like and everybody's <laughs> happy to be in their, you know, unit. Yeah. For exactly that reason, it's like, and we're better than all the oh, others. I never want to be over with the Alpha Box or you know, with you know, an ACO. You know, like it's like, but then yeah. the, you know, then the people in ACO are like, ah, oh, fuck those other guys. <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It's yeah. it's that type of uh, uh, ethos what's built into everyone, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, I know you guys are the same, and that. <laughs> I was just watching you then. Just uh, you were just pouring a whiskey, but I thought I remember. When, where was it now? When I went on one of my first trips, that was it. When we went to uh, the Airborne Rangers and I was being out and I was speaking to the American guys and we're all chewing that tobacco. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not, that doesn't happen in UK. Yeah. And one's, one was doing it in the it's class. And then, the, and then <laughs> later on in the night, I was on Jack Daniels and Coke. <laughs> yeah. And then one time I picked up the wrong glass. I was pissed. But oh, then, no. Oh, and oh, I was no. even, I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. He'd been, he'd been doing it in the glass. But it's like, God. Yeah. Jesus. But I, re- and I also remember we had this guy, uh, this, this para guy, who, and this was when he was on the training unit. And he had actually two years working with Americans. Uh, in the, in the, he actually went to the first Gulf War with him. And, uh, and he came back after two years and he. Took Dipped. up that the back backy and yeah. he's the only he's the only British person I've ever seen doing it. But he was addicted to it in yeah. the mouth and all that. It's it's a really amazing how you know that's never taken off in 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 the in the British. But I, I mean honestly, a, I, I think the, God the American hasn't. military like it runs on that stuff. So it, yeah. it's good that uh, it, it, yeah, it's good uh, that it hasn't. Mel, Melvin, tell us uh, what are you up to today? Where are you at now? What are you working on? Oh, now I'm just, uh, what have I got on now? I'll tell you what I've got. I'm working on, I'm going down to Stoke, because Stoke City, that's my local football team. Okay. Yeah. And I doing, I'm doing quite a lot with their, their community there. And I'm doing challenges, what raises money for the homeless and, and people there. So I'll be, I'll be working on events next week, meeting up with Stoke, the Stoke City, and we're just working on something in the future. I can't say exactly what it is now because it's going to come off as a surprise. So I'm be working on that. And also next week in the week, I'm also going to meet a friend who he's actually the British middleweight champion, uh, and he's going to be fighting a world championship. So I'm going to be meeting up with him, and he does an awful lot for the city of Stoke on Trent as well. This is our 
local city. And, and you, you, know, you, you boxed in the army too, right? Yeah, I used to box then. So that's why I really like love the boxing. I don't do it anymore. I don't even do the train anymore because I've got old injuries. I still keep fit and still train all all the time. Uh, but in the in the military, I did it for about five years. Yeah, to five solid. And literally, we were doing it for nine months a year. And it was that, that was it. We was living the life of the boxers. If you was boxing, you we all used to stay in the same group. You had the best food, just lived in track suits. And then after nine months, you just like, after fire a gun, do the sitting army test, and that was it. But after that, you're back in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in track suits and then boxing. But to me, there was nothing better because you'd listen, you'd have all your unit. So you've got a thousand, an armored infantry unit, you'd have a thousand blokes who know your name, then you've got a thousand blokes who know their name, and you'd be battling each other. And it's just two warriors. And to yeah. me, anybody who gets in the ring and fights, I've take me out off to him, and back in the day, it was we used to every unit used to have its own band. So we used to go and used to get drummed into your tune and that, and everybody knows you. And then you'd be you'd be fighting a Scottish unit, and they come into the bad pipes, and everybody <laughs> knows them. Or you'd be fighting another unit, and they've just got all these bugles. And it's really God. I get the I get the airs on the on the arms now because to me, that's as close to to real combat as you can because you got them I remember you used to walk up the steps getting ready to go into the ring and to me it always reminded me of watching one of these old films where somebody go, gets hung and they used to have the drums beating yeah. in the old yeah. days and they beat and yeah. you, they walk up up the steps to the gallows and then you get hung I used to think in my mind this is just start like going to get hung because I had it in my mind I just didn't ever want you know just get knocked down and show myself up the first round or anything like that I just couldn't wait for that start and just get a few punches and then you're right, I'm in there now, I'm in the game and then that's it, you can you start. But everything in life, everything teaches you a lesson. And even boxing, I remember when I first started, I thought I was invincible because I was very, very fit and I was like winning everyone. And then I remember fighting this guy in another company. This was just into company. And he was he was he was not very good or anything. And anybody thought, oh yeah, I'm going to piss you. And I remember him whacking, and he just took a big shot, and he caught me. And in my mind, I was like, nah, he can't. And my, my, my head had gone. And then I went back to McCorley, and the ref gave me a count, and I'm like, you're saying, are you all right? I can't even remember going back to McCorley. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went back out there, and he got me again. I didn't go down, and it, and it got stopped. Now, anybody else, they could have took that as a negative, and, and you know, I felt really embarrassed now. And I, you could have take that as like, well, that's me, I'm packing and boxing. But what I did, I thought, no, shit. I learned from that. And I just like, right, I'm going to box and this time. It learned me to box wisely. And then I remember many a time I got caught with these big shots. And before, instead of trying to box through it, which I did yeah. that first time, because you think you're invincible, but really you're going really slow. And, that, and next time, bang, I got hit with a shot. And you think, right, that was an odd shot. Then you know to cover up, you know to jab off, you know to spit your gum shield out because then they got stopped. Give you a few seconds, get that gum shield clean because they have to in amateurs, put it in, and then get, you buy yourself time or you, you learn to hold on. And then until you right, mate, back together now, yeah. I can go. So I learned from having that uh, that shock that first time where you see the lightning, you feel, you feel sick, you feel Life's dizzy. And, yeah. yeah. And then now, and uh, that, uh, that's also happened to me in the civilian aspect where I had a, a fight in, in civil, civilian street, you know, drunken fight and all the rest of it. I remember somebody hit me and I'm like, wow, is it to me that hard? I'm getting all the, I can feel these shocks. That's me. I'm going to go out now. And I remember, right, I've got to think, what have I got to do? And then I was, my dad used to say, in the worst case, when I was getting bullied, doesn't matter how big that person is, bite him, sink your teeth into him. <laughs> and I remember doing that when I was a little kid and, and this bully and boy did he stop bullying me then and he could beat me up he could carry on beating me up he knew he'd win but he knew he'd have a bite and it just wasn't worth it Yeah. and I remember getting in this civilian fight it was actually in Australia I heard this, that's just another story <laughs> and uh, <laughs> basically I, I, was going, I was going through a bit of divorce so I wasn't you know I wasn't ready for have a argument of anyone but it was actually sheep shearers and it was a sheep shearers wedding going on and i was having a drink in this hotel 
and they had all food on. I didn't know this food was part of their buffet. So I stopped eating these little <laughs> sausages and pineapple and cheese on a stick and stuff like that because I thought it was a freebie. And then some of this girl come over. She says, do you know that's not, you shouldn't be having that. I said, I didn't know. But then she starts gobbing off at me. Now I'm just going through a bit of divorce. So I wasn't happy with me anyway. Yeah. So I gave her a mouthful, told her what I think of her. And next minute, this guy come across and he was, he was, it was actually sheep shearers. And it was a sheep shearers like stag do all wedding or something. And they were like Popeye. Their arms were just like, the, the forearms are massive because they're picking up the sheep. And, yeah. And, and this guy come up to me, I thought, and I was with another guy. I thought, God almighty, he isn't going to come across. You could tell he was just going to come across and start. So as he's coming close to me, it's not good. It's not right. I thought, right, I've got to get the first punch. And I tried, bang, and he just starts fighting. And luckily, it got broke up. But in Australia, they have, they always have a bar. So we left this hotel bar, but they always seem to have the bars in the basement. And in the basement, they, they all go gambling. So when we left, I thought, oh, the basement bar is on. Let's go down there. And that op- that's open until two in the morning. So me and these lads, we went down there. And then everybody leaves at two o'clock in the morning. So we left. And then at the same time, these guys left. So by the time, this time, they'd had a good drink. And there was a lot of them. And they were like, there's that guy. I'm going to do him. <laughs> anyway, they all, I thought, well, wow, I can't be bothered. And I just said, come on then. I'm, I'm going to get kicking. At least I try and fight. Yeah. He starts hitting me, and I saw that them, that lightning again. And I covered up like in the boxing. I thought, right, I can't box out of this. There's no referee to stop it. I'm just going to get. I'm just waiting to get passed out in a minute. I thought I've got to do something, and I went back to me when as a kid. Right, bite him, and he was that big. I remember he had a white shirt on. And I bit his tit. I was in his chest. And I was like a dog. I'm trying. I remember thinking, I'm trying to put my teeth together. And I was thinking, fucking hell, he's a, he's a, he's a muscular bastard. Because I was trying to get, connect him. And all I remember him saying is, ah, the N word, he said. Then, ah, that's biting me. And all his mates moved away because the good blood on his shirt. They must have been stabbed or something. Everybody's just in shock. And then I just started walking. And then when they all come together, they were just going to pile on me and had me and no kidding you the guy who was with he got the bouncers and a bouncer pulled up in the car he dragged me in he goes get in the fucking car these australians got me in the car and got me away well i thought god almighty well, I anyway i don't know where i come that story from but it, it's all come after that all came from the boxing yeah it teaches you a lesson so in life there's always lessons so you know you, you learn from them don't you so that helped me out a couple of times. What, what, what's up, D? I have one more question for Melvin. Melvin, were you ever lucky enough to get your hands on uh, those uh, Rolex Explorers they gave SAS members? Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got Rolex, yeah. I've got a <laughs> uh, Rolex, I've got a Breitling, and I, I've got a Breitling, a Rolex, and a D Squadron from a smaller, a smaller company. Yeah, I've got a Discord and one, a Breitling and a Rolex. I could get them here, but I'd, I'd cool. have to nip downstairs and get them if you want me to. Yeah, yeah like, so those SAS Explor- Explorers that they made for Rolex are, like, super, like, highly sought after. They go for, like, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Wow. Yeah, 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 because yeah. I got a couple of kids, so I thought, right, I'll have one. And at the time, you're like, wow, this has cost me a thousand pounds, and that's a lot of money, isn't it, when you're in and that? Yeah. But then... They, they're unique. They've just got your zap number on and they, they've just got, you know, personalized. And, yeah, they're going for an awful lot of money. Uh, have you, do you want me to go get one? Have you got time? I can just run downstairs or not? Uh, we sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, why not? Yeah. I, I, okay, I'll, I'll just nip down. Yeah, I'm going to. Okay. Uh, and, guys out there, uh, if you are so inclined, please check out our Patreon. There is a link down in the description. Uh, you can subscribe for five dollars a month, and that gets you ad-free episodes. All the Team House episodes you get ad-free, and uh, we do some bonus episodes on there too. And we really appreciate all you guys going there and uh, supporting the channel. You also get the Eyes On episodes for free too. Free, oh, ad-free. right? Yeah, I should mention that. You know, our our uh, sister podcast, Eyes On, with Andy Milburn and Jason Lyons. Um, you'll get all those episodes ad-free as well. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Casa Carabeo Cigars. My buddy over there makes some awesome sticks. I hope you guys will go check it out. CasaCarabeo.com. Hey, Mayo. Uh, Melvin. Hi. Yeah, so I've got this. Uh, is this one? This is the 
the bright lane. I don't know if you P push that you mic up that. a little bit. There you go. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. Okay, this is the bright lane. And you can see the SS badge. Very, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there. And it's got your number and everything on the back. That's cool. Yeah, so that's the bright lane. That's awesome. And then uh, were made this, is the, for you guys? this is the Rolex. Mm -hmm. And then you've got all the on the back, can you? Yep. That's you a, no, that it's a beautiful, back. beautiful watch. Yeah, yeah. It's got your zap number and everything. I tell you what, the first time I had this, I wore this watch out. I wore it. I had a drink when I got back. I took it off. And then I dropped it, and I smashed the glass, so I had to get done, into a Rolex, that. and yeah. fucking hell, it cost a lot of money. And then this is a, a D Squadron one, personally for D Squadron. And on the back, you could see that, uh, the dagger, you know, the, uh, not the dagger, the, oh, the, the D Squadron. Oh, the D Squadron in the yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, can you see the badge there? It's in black, and it? Don't can't can't really way. see it, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking about yeah. because you yeah. The coin. So they got that badge on because it's just this is just for D Squadron. That's cool. So yeah, so but these, as I say, I, I'll I'll never sell them. I know blokes have come, a few blokes have had uh, gone through bad times and then they've sold them and they've, you know, they've, I, I know they've gone up in price and they collect as items, but yeah, yeah. Um, I must probably go. I must probably get my house burgled now by showing them. They got scouts. <laughs> they got scouts. <scabs. laughs> and, and then you also have uh, your own YouTube channel that's launching. Do you want to tell folks a little bit about that? Yeah, I'm opening a YouTube channel. We're going to start it next week, and we're going to start doing lots of stuff there and doing stuff on resilience and just getting sort of talking about life and having talks and and also doing lots of fitness challenges there and just because. <laughs> I do believe like it's it's mentality, it's consist consistency, and I'm all for work or play hard. I like go out, I like have a beer. I always have done. I think military people are the same, but I still enjoy my. Fit. I still make sure I keep myself fit as well. So you know, uh, and that's whether it's in the gym, whether it's running, uh, uh, whatever type of exercise, it's tabbing especially over the hills. And I like even the other day, I just went for. My wife is doing a Manchester marathon, so she was practicing and she did a 30 kilometer uh, run for part of the training build up for the Manchester marathon in a couple of weeks' time. And so she asked me to go on a training run with her, especially she's supposed to be running with somebody else. And I had a drink the night before, and last minute they couldn't do it. So she says, Will you come? I said, Yeah, because she goes quite slow. So I, I did that, and I thought to myself, I've done 30 kilometers, I feel all right. And it's such a lovely day. So then I ended up just jogging a bit more, and I got to 40. The most I've jogged recently was 50. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go for the 50. And I got to the 50. Now, what I was intending to do from 60 in December, in my mind, I, 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 I just thought of it. One morning I thought, right, I want to do 60 at 60 in six. So that's 60 kilometers at 60 years old in six hours. I said, I want to do that on my birthday. The other day I did it, about, uh, in fact, last week, last Thursday. And uh, I got to 50 kilometers, and I thought, oh, I could get in the six hours here. And so then I thought, right, sorry, I might as well do the 60. So that just came out the blue. I was going to do it in, in December. And then uh, I just did it the other day. So I did six kilometers, which is like 38 miles. Wow, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so, so that's Amazing. a lot. And, and even on these knees and everything, and, and yeah, yeah. so you can you can still get trained. So I, I just enjoy just doing stuff and just different challenges yeah. and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and uh, we'll have a, a link down in the description to his YouTube channel, um, Melvin. I mean, this has been a really fun conversation, man. Is there anything that I failed to ask, or anything that you wanted to put out there that that we haven't covered? Uh, no, you, you've just put my Instagram and then the YouTube, because I'm going to do a lot more things. And I've also got a, a friend, he's a, he's a Sevy friend from Stoke, he's younger, and he's really good on the YouTube and these uh, skits. So we do a bit of fun as well, you know, because like, as I said, sense humor is part of the military. So yeah. it's not just deadly serious and about talking about life. Yeah, it's yeah. having a laugh about things and, and just a common, everything what happens throughout the day, you know, the mistakes, what <laughs> you do. And you just got to laugh at him, aren't you? Because we all, we all mess up and there's always something what 
you know, pisses you off and you just have to have a laugh about whatever it is, whether it's road rage or something happened. It's, it's just, it's part of life, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's, and honestly, I think that, you know, cause when you talked about resilience, like a sense of humor and, you know, like taking the piss out of guys, like that's all part of it. Like if a guy can't handle like guys on his team taking the piss out of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it makes the guys on the team question, I think, sometimes, well, like, can, can we rely on this guy under pressure if he gets so, like, spun up oh, over this little yeah. thing, right? Yeah, yeah, definite. Yeah, it's, it's, that's part of it, isn't it? And I think that's why part of the selection process, they see that, it, you know, you've all got to be able to, give and take it on the team if you don't want give it don't take it and yeah. yeah some people are a bit more serious than others when you know when you when you're with mates you know what what buttons to push in that don't you and stuff, yeah. and stuff exactly. like that you know yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so all right yeah thank you uh melvin and uh who do we have uh on uh monday on monday we have jeff mann who is actually uh, i think he stood up one of the first, if not the first, uh, NSA red teams. Cool. Uh, so one of the first, uh, you know, um, uh, teams to actually be adversarial uh, testing, um, and, penetration testing and whatnot. And then, and then next Friday we have uh, Jonah Mendez coming on, who is a CIA disguise officer, um, and she has a new book coming out. So, Or actually it is out now. So we'll uh, be talking to her on Monday. So. Look forward to seeing all you guys then. Melvin, again, thank no, you for thanks, spending yeah, Friday thanks. evening with us, man. This has been really fun. Yeah, it's been fun, Jack, Dave. Thanks for having us, and thanks, Team House. Yeah, we thank you. It. And uh, thanks, so we'll America. See, we'll, we'll see all of you guys out there on uh, Monday. Take care. Uh, and let us know when your YouTube channel's up so we can plug it. Right, will do. Yeah. Th yeah. Thanks a lot, mate. Also, yeah. Melvin, when you write your book and you, you come for like a book tour and you're in the yeah, States yeah. maybe, we'd love to have you in studio too. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, great. great. That would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome anytime. Hit, hit us up when you're coming through town. I uh, appreciate that. I really do. Absolutely. But I won't be having any. I'll be watching where my drink is. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> if anybody sees that spit inside the stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a quick lesson you learn in Ranger Battalion is if you open a can of coat or if you open a, like a can of soda, yeah, you, ne you never put it down. Yeah, if yeah. you put it down, you don't drink that, from it that, anymore. That was that was a habit. I I quit the day I left the army. Yeah, it was the day I quit dipping. Yeah, yeah, cold turkey. Uh, on on average, how many guys say in your squad and rangers or whatever dip? Two and thirds. Is it like about? Yeah, two thirds Pardon? probably. Uh, yeah, I'd say yeah. fifty percent to two thirds. Like, yeah, like it, it's. It, it's one of, has it never one, been banned, or is it has it ever been? In, in Ranger School, they banned it, but not in the Army as a whole. So in Ranger School, what guys would do instead is, is they would take uh, the coffee from their MREs, because it's ground coffee, and they would pack that uh, just so it'd have <laughs> something in there. Really? Yeah, it, it, be, <laughs> it becomes like a performance drug, I think, in some ways, where... It's like, you know, you're doing, you're up all night, you're doing yeah, these yeah. patrols. It keeps and so you guys are just like hitting the nicotine to like keep them like going and focused and everything. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I remember going to the PX though. I got, that got me on the, the jet meet. I'd never had that before. This was years ago in the eighties, yeah. you know, where uh, you used to have the, the, the jerk, jerk beef and that. God, yeah. that, that was brilliant. Yeah. And I still love it now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. Beef jerking, that's it, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's funny because you mentioned like the, you know, like the, uh, the booze and, you know, the dip and stuff like that. But it was Phil, wasn't it? Phil Campion who was telling us how he, the tea. he, he brewed a spot of tea on Target while he's like, it's like, well, that's something in America. Like that to us is so, you know, ultimately British that, he would, <laughs> yeah. that while he's in a hide or, you know, on a support position, he's brewing tea. Oh yeah, the brew is that. That's always the tea all the time. Brew. But you guys is always coffee, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, but I right. think the world now it's all frappuccinos and whatever. You know what I mean? Right. It's, got, it's gone bonkers in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Everyone's walking and, around. And even here in the states, even with the tea, like they church it up. You know, they've got the like the chai latte. Mm. Like, you oh, know, you, you can't just get a tea or a coffee. Like. It's got to be yeah, something you, fancy now. You say, no, just, just get me a normal tea. I don't want yeah. all this. Yeah, and they got to give out all this stuff. Oh, just, just normal. Just give me tea. Just, as it is, normal. We say NATO, NATO standard. Yeah, NATO standard tea. All right. Yeah. Um, 
All right, Mel Melvin, we'll see you next time. You know, let us know when that book's coming out, and we'll be happy to uh, have you on here again. And uh, we'll see all you guys out there next time.